Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call this Bloomington City Council meeting to order. It's Monday, September 18th, 2023. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here in the council chambers and online. We will start our meeting as we always do. If you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thanks to everybody for joining us this evening on our last council meeting of the summer of 2023. This is our last one for the summer. Uh, appreciate everyone here. We are missing one council member tonight. Council member um, Nelson is not with us, and uh, Mr. Verbrugge is joining us online. Uh, I'm obviously masked up tonight because I, I've got the crud and I don't want to give it to everybody up here. And also I've been uh, hanging out with people who have been testing positive for COVID. So I want to make sure that we don't get anybody sick. So that's why I'm masked up tonight. Our first uh, item of a, uh, on the agenda tonight is the approval of tonight's agenda. And on our agenda, we have under introductory items, we're going to uh, meet some new employees here in the city of Bloomington. We have two proclamations. Item 2.2 is a proclamation for Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, item 2. Point, wow, 2. Point, there it is. 2.3, we have a proclamation for the International Day of Peace. 2.4, we've got a Sustainability Commission appointment to make this evening. Our consent business, and Councilmember Martin has our consent business. It is a lengthy one. We've got 19 items on our consent agenda tonight. And under item 4, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, We've got uh, item 4.1 and 4.2 is uh, our, the resolutions adopting our preliminary 2024 tax levy and preliminary 2024 general fund budget. Uh, next up under our he hearings and resolutions are, are an annual uh, uh, item we up, uh, take up. Uh, public hearings to do assessments regarding our public nuisances, our public nuisance abatement, tree removal assessments, our weed and brush removal, delinquent, uh, delinquent assessments, and then uh, civil fines for property-related violations and assessments. Item 4.8 is a public hearing regarding rezoning from on Lindale Avenue properties from B2 to B4. And then item 4.9 is approval uh, of our neighborhood traffic management and plan with uh, an opportunity for public comment on that, um, that proposed plan. We'll wrap up this evening with our item 5.1, which is our city council policy and issue update as we always do. Council, any changes, uh, additions, subtractions to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I would move approval of tonight's agenda as stated. Second. Motion and a second for tonight's agenda. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much. We've got an agenda. Item 2.1 on the agenda is the introduction of new employees. And I think we have a total of 246 new employees within our public works department. Our Public Works Director, Mr. Carl Keel, is going to be Master of Ceremonies here. Good evening, Mr. Keel. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, this evening, we have uh, six new employees that I'd like to introduce, uh, all from our maintenance division, but from different work groups in our maintenance division. So we'll start out with facilities maintenance, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Chad Haynes. Chad, Chad is a facilities attendant over here at Civic Plaza. Uh, comes to us with a, over six years of experience in property management, uh, but before that had spent 25 years uh, in the horse business as a trainer and uh, taking care of shows for horses. Uh, he's a, a Army veteran, uh, grew up in, in Lakeville. He says it when it was still a small town, but I think he still <laughs> lives there. Um, he also uh, has uh, hosted st uh, students from Sweden and developed a strong relationship with those families and maintains that and visits Sweden whenever he's able. Um, finally, I'd say about Chad is he's a, a, a rabid gopher hockey fan and has had held season tickets for over 20 years. So, Chad. Yeah, I'm thankful to be a part of the city and look forward to great adventures here with you. Well, good evening. Thanks for being with us this evening, Chad. I also remember when Lakeville was a small town. And yes, it's, it's not anymore. Way it's not too anymore. Big. Uh, way too big. Welcome aboard. We're glad to have you on board. Great. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, next is Joe, uh, Joe Kubiseski. Uh, Joe is a, is a technician in our facilities maintenance group. Uh, comes with us with over 10 years of experience in facilities maintenance, uh, most recently with Ramsey County, uh, with their Park and Recreation Department. Uh, while here, he's uh, completed his carpentry course at Summit Academy 
and uh, just recently got his CDL, uh, that's his commercial driver's license, so we can use him for snow plowing, which is a good thing. Um, Joe grew up in St. Paul, and uh, when not at work, he loves time spending uh, time with his wife and his uh, two children, one quite young, I think. Yes. Yes. Born. So, Joe. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to work with this wonderful county, and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Well, thank you for being with us, Joe, and not to imply that we will use you for snow plowing. We won't use any of our employees. We appreciate the efforts that they make uh, within our <laughs> snow plowing, but uh, glad to have you on board. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks. You'll contribute to our plowing. There we go. <laughs> uh, Kyle Kuczynski. Yep. Kyle is uh, now we're moving over to our fleet maintenance group. These are the folks that uh, take care of all the vehicles and equipment in the city. And Kyle is one of those folks. He's a, a fleet maintenance uh, technician. Uh, has comes to us with seven years of experience uh, at the most recently with the Freightliner business, so with with heavy heavy equipment. Um, uh, before that, had spent some time in kind of the more the building maintenance uh, and management for four years, and uh, he has gone to Dakota County Technical College, and he has a number of certificates in all kinds of different equipment uh, related to fleet maintenance type activities. So, and uh, kind of as a side note, uh, he has, he grew up in Bloomington. So, welcome Kyle. Yep, thank you. I appreciate the time and everything and being able to be employed here. Well, thank you for being with us. Where did, where did you grow up here in Bloomington? Uh, 82nd Nicollet. Oh, very good. Right next to McDonald's. Great. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Sophie, if we go on, go on to fleet maintenance, uh, still in fleet maintenance, uh, Ponky, uh, sorry, Sophie Pong Savat is a office support specialist in our maintenance group. So she's the person that kind of keeps track of all the different types of work that's going on, the ordering of, of parts, uh, the ordering of equipment, all kinds of uh, support services that keeps our, our operation functioning. Comes to us with 10 years of experience, uh, again, most recently at Ramsey County. Uh, has a BA degree in management and a concentration in logistics and operations. And grew up in the Twin Cities. And when not here, likes to do yoga and take walks around the lake, spend time with friends, and travel whenever possible. So, Sophie. Nice to meet everyone. <laughs> Welcome, Sophie. Thank you. Great. Uh, now over to uh, street maintenance. We'll start with uh, Tom Hilgert. Tom. Uh, Tom is an equipment operator and comes to us with 11 years of experience uh, in the steel manufacturing industry. Uh, he has an associate's degree from Hennepin Tech. Uh, grew up in, in Bloomington, and he, where he lives with his wife and his son. Uh, he enjoys time with his family uh, at the lake in the summer and playing hockey in the parks during the winter. So, Tom. Thank you. I uh, look forward to serving the citizens of Bloomington. Well, good. Thank you so much. We're happy to have you here and happy to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. Thanks. And our last new employee for this evening is Pat Kelly. Uh, Pat is also in our street maintenance bunch. He's a, an equipment operator, uh, has a commercial driver's license, and 10 years of experience, uh, two years at DEMCON most recently. Um, grew up in Elko Newmarket, so on the south side of the Twin Cities. Loves, time, uh, loves to spend time hunting and fishing and traveling and hanging out with family and friends. So, welcome, Pat. Thanks. Looking to good roads ahead. Pun intended. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. Very good. Thanks for being here. So, uh, Tom, Pat, Chad, Joe, Kyle, and Sophie, thank you very much for, for taking the time to come here this evening and, and introduce yourself. It's great to introduce yourself to, to us here on the council, but also to the general public so they can see the servants uh, of the city of Bloomington, the people who are serving them, and the good work that you're doing. And uh, appreciate you being here and, and looking forward to seeing more of you and, and looking forward to the work that you're going to do. So, thanks for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Our next two items on the agenda are resolutions. So I'm going to make my way down to the podium here. As I said, we have two resolutions this evening. 
the first being uh, a resolution in support for Latinx Hispanic, Hi Hispanic Heritage Month. And um, we're going to be presenting this, and it's going to be officially received by uh, Daryl Navarro. Why don't you come on up, if you could, please? Daryl Lee is uh, president of the Employee Resource Group, EDGE, which stands for Ethnic Diverse Group of Employees. And I'll let you introduce yourself here in just a moment and your special guest, if you'd like, or I'll be happy to introduce your special guest also. So, all right. So I want to get started on the proclamation for Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month, September 15th through October 15th, 2023. Whereas in 1988... The United States Congress adopted a resolution designating September 15th to October 15th of each year as National Hispanic Heritage Month. And whereas September 15th is the anniversary of independence for five Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Additionally, Mexico achieved independence on September 16th, and Chile achieved independence on September 18th. And whereas this month's theme Latinos Driving Prosperity, Power, and Progress in America is a time to reflect on the future of the city of Bloomington and the significant role that the Latinx Hispanic community has had and will have on our city's prosperity, power, and progress, recognizing the significant strides of Latinx Hispanic people in economic, political, and social growth. And whereas the Latinx Hispanic community's rich cultural heritage has had a profound influence on our country through their strong commitment to family, faith, hard work and services, and they have enhanced and shaped our national heritage with centuries of old traditions that reflect the multi-ethnic and multicultural customs of their community. And whereas the city of Bloomington is home to more than 9,000 Latinx Hispanic residents, the city of Bloomington remains committed to ensure Latinx Hispanic residents who call Bloomington home have every opportunity to achieve their dreams, feel safe, welcomed, and embraced despite the ongoing challenges in social justice and civil rights that exist within society. And whereas honoring and celebrating the history, achievements, contributions, and diversity of the Latinx Hispanic community will build and foster relationships between all communities throughout Minnesota. Now therefore, be it resolved that I, Tim Bussey, Mayor of the City of Bloomington, do hereby proclaim September 15th through September 5th, uh, October 15th, 2023, as Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month, dated this 18th day of September, 2023. This is an annual proclamation that we have been doing for the past couple of years. I'm proud that we have the opportunity to do this. I think it's an important proclamation that we have and one that uh, certainly is relevant in so many different ways. And uh, Darley, now you are, as it, born in Bogota, Colombia, is that yes. correct? Very good. And you've been, you came to the United States when you were 20 and uh, moved to Georgia, from Georgia to Minnesota a couple of years ago, employed with the city for a couple of years. And now you're working on your master's degree in planning, is that correct? Very excited to have you, very proud to have you here, and uh, proud to have you as an employee. And I, I won't steal your thunder. I'll let you, if you'd like to say a few words, and I'd like to have you introduce your special guest as well. Come on, grab the, no. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Sorry, I'm giving you my back. <laughs> Um, so Hispanic Heritage Month is a time to celebrate diversity. This is a, a term that encompasses uh, from many different countries, regions, languages, and cultures, from the Caribbean to South America, from Spain to the United States. Hispanic and Latino communities have played an important role in shaping the United States. Um, their influence can be seen in our art, culture, science, politics, and more, much more. The innovating, uh, innovation and dedication have created jobs and fuel economic growth, strengthening our communities um, in the process. Uh, it is an honor to stand before you today. Um, I, I have a, a guest, an important guest, which is my mom here today. Um, and this is for all the parents out there who left everything behind to give their children a better future. Um, to provide the children uh, with the opportunities that they were never given. Uh, this is for you, Mom, uh, who are, you're here today, and for my sister, who is probably watching me at home. Um, a thank you is not enough, and if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here today. Um, finally, just let us learn from the stories and achievement of the hip Hispanic and Latino Americans, and let us work together to ensure that the contributions continue to shape our nation for the future generations. And let us embrace the spirit of unity for a Bloomington to 
tomorrow together. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I think we officially need to get a picture. And then we'll officially call mom up for a picture as well. <laughs> up there. Okay, come on. You gotta come up for the picture also. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight. It's very nice. Thank you. A second proclamation this evening is for the International Day of Peace, which is September 21st, 2023. Uh, I'll, I'll just get into the proclamation, do a bit of an explanation a bit afterwards. So the International Day of Peace, September 21st, 2023. Whereas the issue of peace embraces the deepest hopes of all peoples and remains humanity's guiding inspiration. And whereas in 1981, the United Nations proclaimed the International Day of Peace be devoted to commemorating and strengthening the ideals of peace, both within and among all nations and peoples. And whereas as our communities and our world continue to see a rise in division and conflict, our city remains dedicated to peace, which affirms a vision of our world at peace and fosters cooperations between individuals, organizations, and nations. And whereas the year 2023 marks 16 years of Civic Plaza as a peace site, which represents our commitment to seek peace within ourselves and others, reach out in service, protect the environment, respect diversity, foster inclusivity, and be responsible citizens of the world. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Tim Bussey, Mayor of the City of Bloomington, do hereby proclaim September 21st 2023 as the International Day of Peace, dated the 18th day of September, 2023. Now the theme for this year's International Day of Peace is actions for peace, which is appropriate. It's not just the words, it's the actions of peace. And it's a call for action that recognizes individual and collective responsibility to foster peace wherever we are. And as, I've, uh, as I mentioned here, 16 years of Civic Plaza as a peace site and I know there are other peace sites across the city of Bloomington and within a number of our schools. And uh, I think we have peace poles representing uh, throughout the city at, at all of our schools. I think we, our, most, our newest one is at Normandale Banshell. Uh, it really does uh, make a mark, uh, make, make a significant commitment or shows the city's commitment to, to seeking that peace, not just within ourselves, but also acting toward peace and making sure that we have peace within and throughout our community. So proud to uh, declare this International Day of Peace on September 21st, 2023. And I uh, hope you can all recognize it in one way or another in your own hearts. So thank you all so very much. Next on our agenda is item 2.4, and that is an appointment to our Sustainability Commission. And um, within this uh, Sustainability Commission vacancy, we have uh, one opening and we had five applicants. And I know that a, a screening process was done and there is a recommendation regarding the appointment to our Sustainability Commission. And the interview panel, uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro, and uh, Angela Bagash from our Sustainability Commission did the, uh, the interviews and came forward with a recommendation. And I think the Sustainability Commission recommendation was to, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Councilmember D'Alessandro, to appoint uh, Sean McFarling to a term on the, on the date to the appointment uh, with the appointment of February 28th, 2026. That is correct. Very good. Council, so that is the recommendation that is brought forward to us uh, with other strong candidates, but this was the recommendation of the appointment to the Sustainability Commission. Unless there's a discussion for other possible appointments to the Sustainability Commission, I'd look for a motion. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, Mayor, when we get to policy and issue up updates, I don't want to talk about the recommendation. I'm sure that my colleague did a fine job along with the, the panel. Um, I'd like to talk about when we schedule these things. Um, 
to just ensure that we get as many uh, council members there uh, as possible. But we can talk about that when we get down to the policies and issued up updates. Sounds good. Understood. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I'd be happy to make the motion. Uh, just let me get my act together here. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Um, so, yes, the, the motion is uh, to appoint uh, Sean McFarland to a term from the date of appointment, which I assume is today, today. to 2020, uh, to February 28, 2026, on the Sustainability Commission. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman, to appoint Sean McFarling to the Sustainability Commission, uh, effective today, running through February 28, 2026. Any further council discussion on this? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Congratulations, Sean. Congratulations to the Sustainability Commission on their newest member. Very good. Item three on the agenda is our consent business, and Councilmember Martin has tonight's lengthy consent agenda. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So far, I have only heard uh, holds from Councilmember Lohman on items 3.4 and 3.5. Was there any others? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'll go ahead and move approval of uh, 3.1 to 3.3 and 3.6 through 3.19. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Carter to accept tonight's consent business as stated, uh, excluding 3.4 uh, and 3.6, is that correct? Uh, four or, and five. Four and five, excuse me, four and five, 3.4, 3.5, otherwise as stated. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council Member Lohman, item 3.4. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, this is a resolution uh, for budget adjustments to transfer uh, from the strategic priority funds to the city facilities fund. And um, my understanding is this is for a remodel of, of one of our departments. And what I'm just trying to get... Uh, uh, just try to get some clarity on some things here, just so I understand, um, you know, is this what we've done in the past in terms of, you know, using, you know, what essentially is a, a, a fund that the council utilizes for its strategic priorities, you know, to, to do things, uh, you know, for a uh, for a staff group. That's that's one question I have. If the manager has that, and then I've got several other ones that I want, I'd like to ask. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we have not, in my recollection, uh, tapped the strategic priorities fund for uh, a major remodel project like this. But I'd also say, at least in our time, that we haven't had a major remodel project like this, and. Uh, the facilities fund is uh, strained to support it uh, exclusively. Uh, where it fits within the strategic priorities fund is that this is the um, product of a study that we did about a year and a half ago regarding the HRA and the Port Authority, and uh, how we were going to uh, how we were going to utilize those two entities. Uh, furthering the, the strategic work of the city council. And part of that outcome uh, was to bolster the Port Authority in a pretty significant way that we had to add capacity in the Community Development Department uh, in bringing on new staff. And so part of this is a realignment to match with the recommendations from the HRA and the Port Authority realignments. Uh, and uh, everything else just follows from it. We are getting to a point in the city where uh, these facilities are reaching uh, the their useful end. We can certainly get more years out of them, but when we have to bring in new staff and we're trying to accommodate moving around to uh, do that, um, the the approach at this time was to look at the remodel as being the the right thing to do. So that's that's why we're utilizing the strategic priorities fund. I'd also uh, note that the HRA and the Port Authority have each contributed uh, to this project a significant amount um, and also trying to uh, not tap the facilities fund too much because we have other needs there. And, and I'm also just trying to also understand how much this amount is, you know, uh, I've been, you know, I've, depending on how you count this and I'm not sure if I'm counting this correctly, it looks like it's almost, you know, 1.4 million. Or, or, or is it or is it 900 or is it a million what what is it that we have here because I see the furniture here 
is, uh, which is the next item here is 3.5, is 535. Is that included in the amount that, that gets us up to the 800 or, or $900,000? Uh, uh, it's just not clear to me where this is coming from and what the total cost of this remodel is. <clears throat> Council members, Council Member Loman, the total project cost is nine hundred thousand. The five hundred thousand is coming from Strategic Priorities Fund, and the remainder is uh, being contributed by the HRA and the Port Authority. So it's nine hundred thousand dollars plus the five hundred. No, Mr. Mayor and Council members, the total project cost is nine hundred thousand. Okay. What's being asked for the Strategic Priorities Fund is the five hundred thousand. Okay. For the furniture. That's for the entire project. So it's it's uh, walls and uh, fixtures and furnishings, cabinets, chairs, all of it. Okay. It's just I, I have a dot, you know, Mayor, I've never seen us do use our strategic priority dollars in this way. I'm not saying that's that's right or wrong, but um, I just have never seen us do this before. And the, the, the concern that I have with, with going down this route, and I, I certainly can see the, the connection with, with a strategic priority, but, you know, there are other parts of the city that, that probably also need, um, you know, fixing up and that type of thing. And I know that when we had the situation uh, with the fire department, uh, we wanted to use, utilize the strategic priorities. We made a plan that that's what we were, we were going to do. And then we designated those dollars over several years to kind of do that. And what my fear is, is that we would start down this process for this department, recognizing that we have several other departments that need to have upgrades and up um, and up upticks. And we're kind of just doing this piecemeal kind of, you know, not being planful about this. And, um, you know, from my, my, my standpoint, um, I could support, this particular thing, if we have a plan around it, and it's something we plan on doing on an ongoing basis, you know, we say we're going to take dollars from the strategic priority plan each year, and we're going to look at different departments and and try to upgrade them and, and, and updo them. I just don't know that I can support uh, this use of the strategic priorities um, in this fashion. This is just totally not something I've ever seen us do. And I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with this. That's the the very usage of a uh, you know our, our capital funds uh, is to be able to utilize those for that. And if we didn't properly put our dollars aside for that, I just don't. That makes sense to kind of do this. Um, I'm just afraid about this precedence we're starting here. And I have no problem starting that if we're, we are going to move into uh, an initiative by which we want to invest in the rest of the city. There are lots of other parts of the city that I think. Um, you know, could also use a use a touch up, and I'd like us to be planful about it, Mayor. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. Um, so, just for context, I don't. I'm not 100. I'm not uh, intending to be argumentative with you, Councilmember Lohman, But to say it's one department, I think, is a little bit of a misnomer, right? It's more than 80 people across everything from buildings and inspections to our assessor's office to the HRA to the Port Authority to the clerk's office, you know, it's a significant amount of, of the population of the people that do work every day. Um, it represents at least two of the counters that we support everything from passport services to licensing to, and, you know, to permitting to um, uh, all of us showing up as candidates to get our election certificates and stuff like that organized. I mean, it's all of that, right? So I want to be careful that we're not we're, we're, we're kind of thinking about this as just a, a, a like a one person over on the corner deciding to do some kind of vanity project. I don't think that that's correct, and I'm not suggesting that's what you said, but I want to make sure contextually we have that co uh, clear. The other thing is it, it is kind of planful. I mean, it maybe not the strategic priorities fund piece of it, but I think that based on the data that we received when we were looking at this, <clears throat> this goes back to more than, you know, for 2021, even before I've been on council, when this has been looked at. We as a council made the decision to make the changes in the Port Authority and the HRA. We did that. That that triggers a lot of this change requirement, right? Um, to make it so that those folks can do a better job of working with their partners in buildings and inspections or environmental health. Like I love the direction we're going um, in with environmental health and the HRA working together. So we're not just bringing a stick to those conversations or bringing a carrot as well, right? To say to, to folks, hey, we want to actually help you stay in your home. The goal is not to 
find you and find you and find you and assess you until you can't be here anymore. The goal is to make that that home something that's part of the stock of Bloomington that's valuable. Um, the HRA has levers for that, but they're sitting literally as far away from as possible from each other, and they don't have a chance to interact regularly. And that's that's not good for the efficiency of the government, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, I had the chance to actually go through the site. I don't know if anybody else has taken a tour of the area we're talking about, but it's also really unsafe in a lot of ways. There's some sections of it that the only way that you could get out in a, like a fire or an active shooter situation is to break a window. And so like, I don't think that that's probably good. I think we should probably do better about that and stuff like that too. And so I think that we're gonna get mul multiple benefits from this project. Now, the question about whether strategic priorities funds should be used for it or not is an, a, a good question, an open question. Um, I, I made the same concerns and I, I thought, well, you know, one, just because we have these numbers, the, we don't know that these numbers are gonna be the numbers, right? There's money, <clears throat> there's money there that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's money there that um, uh, is contingency and stuff like that. It may not get used, right? And I would certainly expect that any money that was not used comes right back into the Strategic Priorities Fund. It doesn't sit over there in community developed development to be used for something else, right? So I certainly would hope that that would be the case. Um, and then the second thing I'll say on that is um, if community development um, was putting this money aside um, over time, which, you know, would be the right way to do it. It might take them 10 or 12 years to get to the funding level we're talking about here, in which case we would not be getting the benefit of all of that efficiency during that time, even though we as council have asked them to take on this additional responsibility and make these strategic changes. So um, I think of it more like a loan than a, um, like, a strategic priorities like gift, if you will, in the sense that I feel like we're gonna get it back in a couple of ways strategically, right? One, better efficient use of the of the the people and the work that they do. Number two, the um, expectations that we have of them to move revenue generating projects through the city in a better way, like all the community development we want them to do in our you know commercial nodes, for example. And then three, um, we will get some of the money back just by virtue of the of the fact that this probably won't cost as much as we're estimating it will um, because that that you you know there's carryover and other things like that that they can find so those those are my thoughts on it and that's why I'm I'm cool with it thanks before you respond Councilmember uh, I'd like to let others weigh in too is uh, Councilmember Carter uh, thank you Mayor um, so I just want to say that I uh, agree with a lot of what Councilmember D'Alessandro said I also want to say that. Um, I want to thank uh, Community Development Director Carla Henderson. There was so much staff engagement that went into this. Mm -hmm. And post-pandemic, not to say we're like post-pandemic, I don't even know what that means, but now that we're at this point, there are a lot of organizations, companies, rethinking how people come back to work or if they're going to work full-time in the office or not, you know, and, um, and having to spend resources on these types of projects. And so it's not surprising to me that that we're here and that we're, you know, looking at how we can more effectively have staff working together. Um, and again, from a leadership perspective, I just think it speaks volumes um, to Carla's leadership that, I mean, she spent over a year engaging with staff, getting their input in the design and the layout and, you know, how things functionally should work. And she didn't have to do that. Um, and so I just want to thank her for her leadership in this space. Um, you know, although, um, I also hear what you're saying, Council Member Lohman, and I and you know me, I love the kind of longer term strategic goal setting conversations and I do welcome that conversation, especially as we go into the next year to think about how do we really want to use those funds um, and not kind of have this more reactive like and now here's this thing and now here's this thing. So totally agree with you on that. Um, but otherwise I do plan on um, supporting the proposal put forth to us tonight because I do agree that there are going to be significant benefits uh, to the work that we want to see accomplished in the city. Councilmember Loman. Thank you. I'm not sure if anybody else wants to weigh in. Um, you know, certainly I'm not opposed to the remodel. I've let Carla know that, and I think you've done fine work. Not opposed to that. My, the, the key to my issue here is the use of the strategic priority dollars. Um, you know, and you know, you know, if my colleagues want to go along and do that, that's that's perfectly fine. But uh, from a you know from a responsibility in terms of how we we do this, we really need to think about you know what we're what precedents we're starting here. And again, um, I think this is a, a fine way if we if we agree that 
this is what we want to do, not only with this this department, but we want to do this with many other departments. And I think there are other, you know, for example, you had mentioned, uh, uh, you know, safety. You know, there's other parts of the city that I think that we need to upgrade the safety. And there's a number of departments and areas where I'd like us to, to, to look at trying to do that. And so um, to, to just simply spend this on here and then kind of stop the conversation, I, that has a concern for me. So I have a couple other questions for the, for the manager. Um, uh, manager, I'm just curious, when was the last time this area was renovated? Mr. Brookie? Mr. Council members, Council Member Loman, uh, I don't recall that it has been other than uh, some moving around of workstations in the planning area, um, but there hasn't been a, a wholesale uh, change in, in recent memory. Most of the workstations are the original workstations of the building. And then my last question I have for you, a manager is uh, uh, seemingly we have, um, you know, uh, some large investments coming up with the sales piece where, you know, if we were to build another building that may also shift uh, and adjust where the parks and, and recreational area would be as well. Um, how would we deal with those changes and the other changes that we know that are coming with uh, with the city's departments and and the, and the like that we have here, um, I just want to make sure this is this a one time thing. Or are we intending to do this multiple times after this? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Loman. That's a really good question. Uh, we are actually uh, commissioning a space study uh, to look at those types of future issues um, because I appreciate your comments about you know the. The nature of this project and and not wanting to do these things piecemeal we we feel the same way uh but again sort of following up on the the fact that you know this is a little bit of a byproduct of a service assessment that we did um the space study analysis will look at those issues for the next uh, uh three to five and, and ten and ten years and beyond um because we do have another uh, we do have other spaces in the building like you've mentioned council member um, where we have some safety concerns, where we have space utilization concerns. Um, and we've talked in the past about um, other spaces that are being used for storage um, and you know other expansion needs that we have. So if the local option sales tax passes and we do indeed move some of our operations into a new building, that'll be accounted for within the space study. Um, all of those uh, questions hopefully will be answered over the course of the next year or so, uh, hopefully less when we're conducting that study. And I also wanted to follow up uh, on a comment from Council Member D'Alessandro uh, regarding the project uh, estimates. You, you're correct, we always include a contingency in our project costs. And a project like this, I think we have fairly well identified what the project costs are. Um, so we will manage that contingency uh, very carefully. And I think uh, having direction from the council would be good on where you want those residual funds to go. Uh, we could put them back a third, a third, a third, or a prorata basis on the sources. So HR report and strategic priorities gets a prorated share of what they contributed. Or you can say, we want it all to go to strategic priorities, or you can allocate it somewhere else we don't have to do that tonight, but I think that's uh, a good point by Council Member D'Alessandro that the council might want to consider. Well, to wrap this up, um, uh, I just, you know, given, uh, you know, we have this and we've got also later on the levy uh, later on today. And so I just want to make sure that we're not going to, you know, get that information later on. And then we can't react to that in terms of, the, of what the levy looks like because there, there, are, there are needs out there for those departments, safety needs uh, that are there. So given uh, I think there's enough folks up here to, to, to support it, um, I'm not going to be supporting this uh, the way it's written today unless I could see that plan as a part of this and, a, and that we look at other departments as a part of this. Um, that's what a strategic priorities plan should be. Um, in my opinion, uh, this council member wants to support stuff, and I think that this this leads us down a, a road of you know, we talk about trying to control spending. Uh, this is a way in which you know, we've got to control our spending. We've got to be careful about how we do this because if we start doing it here, and I certainly support this, but we need to be planful in terms of how we're, how we're doing this. And so I just don't think this is a good way to to spend our budget in this this fashion this way. 
Duly noted, Council Member. Thank you. Council, any additional comments on this? I will say, Council Member, I agree with, uh, and with both you and with uh, Mr. Verbrugge in that ideally doing this in a piecemeal fashion is not ideal. But it's also not the first time we've done it. We, within the past year or so, we approved upgrades to the police department. We've improved up upgrades to, to different departments over the years from different funds, perhaps, but in different ways, we've found the money when we've seen the need, we've, we've made the investment to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of the department. So uh, ideal, no. Setting a prior, uh, I, will this set the, um, the way we, the path forward, the way we always do it? No, I wouldn't agree that would be the case either because the city council has the authority to, to make decisions on this type of thing. And if we don't think it's appropriate, it's not appropriate. So in this case, if, if the belief is that it is appropriate, we can move forward at this time with this one. So, council, any additional questions or comments? Mayor, I'm happy Mr. to. Mayor, if I may. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge? Just to remind council members, this is a budget adjustment, which does require five council members voting in the affirmative to pass it. So you, I think you have two actions. I think you have the project it, itself and, the, uh, and then the budget adjustment vote. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Council Member Martin. Uh, I'm happy to make the motion. Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor. I will move that we approve the budget adjustment resolution to transfer $419,433 from the 4200 Strategic Priorities Fund to the 7700 Facilities Fund to complete funding necessary for the Community Development Remodel Project. Do we have a second? Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, essentially what uh, Council Member Martin read was to accept item 3.4 on tonight's consent agenda. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 5-1 with Council Member Lohman in opposition. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Would, would you like the whole one or can I just motion approval of item 3.5? I'm sure Ms. Mandershide would appreciate if you would read it, read it into right. the record. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Mayor, I will move that we approve the purchase of furniture for the remodel of community development utilizing Omnia and Sourcewell cooperative contracts from Interium for a total cost of $535, $12.25. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to accept item 3.5 on tonight's cons uh, consent agenda. See, I get to do the shorthand, but uh, <laughs> now that it's in the record. <laughs> Uh, any uh, So item 3.5 on tonight's uh, council uh, consent business. Any further discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much, Council Member Martin. Thanks for your comments, Council Member Lohman. Appreciate you bringing that up. We will move on in tonight's agenda to our item 4, which is our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And our first item is item 4.1 which is the consideration of the preliminary 2024 tax levy. And we have with us tonight, uh, Kari Carlson, our, I'm going to call you a budget manager, and I know that's Deputy your, Finance Deputy officer. Finance, I knew that was an outdated uh, title, I apologize, Deputy Finance Director. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this evening is the night that the council will pass resolutions to set the preliminary 2024 tax levy and budget. The city is required to submit this to Hennepin County by the end of the month. The, as a reminder, the preliminary tax levy amount is the maximum amount that can be levied next year. The council can lower this amount at the December 4th Truth and Taxation public hearing, but it cannot be increased. So here's the agenda for this evening. Uh, similar to our discussion from last month about the budget, I will quickly review our budgetary approach, the increased public engagement that we've done, the key budget factors, a preliminary tax levy, um, the impacts to the median value home. We have added in here a comparison to other cities that we did not have last month, as well as a, a graphic for an allocation of this proposed 2024 tax dollar. And then we'll go over the um, highlight some dates on the budget calendar that's still to come. So as a review, this budget continues the city's investments in public safety. 
It's structured to maintain the city services that residents value and expect. And there has been a focus on the strategic allocation of resources and the budget requests align with the city's strategic plan, Bloomington Tomorrow Together. And finally, city staff and the council have increased public engagement in the budget process. Over the past few years, the city's worked to include the voices of residents in our budget process in ways that we had not done before. So we've been out about in the community gathering feedback on what residents value and prioritize. We've been at the Normandale Lake Bandshell concerts and events at farmer's markets, kids shows at the parks across the city, um, and, and open houses for departments. And we've made a point this year to not only get to a greater number of events, but also to ensure that those events are at different parts of the city and different times of the day and on different days of the week. And uh, people that are working those events have included um, not only me or just finance staff, but department heads and members of the city council, which we greatly appreciate. So um, at the time that this presentation was published on September 13th, we had been at 11 events. And uh, we just had another budget table at the farmer's market yesterday, or Saturday. And so um, at this time, or at, when this presentation was published, we had interacted with 673 residents. Now we are uh, close to 800. So we had talked to a lot of people on Saturday. It was a beautiful day. We had a lot of people stop by. And uh, the fire chief, Yuli Seal, was with me, as well as Renee Clark from Parks and Recreation. Um, so the number of uh, resident interactions um, has been wonderful. And I also have an updated slide here. Um, just a bit of a review with a little bit different numbers because we've um, had another event since the last time I talked to you. So as a reminder, we've got on our budget table that we have out at events in the community, we have that tabletop uh, budget display with the, um, the information board with the, the six individual canisters that are labeled. And um, the signs here are shown as what's on that tabletop display. And uh, as a review again, um, the different categories are parks, arts, recreation, and natural resources, facilities and infrastructure, equitable economic growth, public safety, healthy community, and a connected, welcoming community. And a lot of these um, mirror our strategic uh, priorities plan. And the people who stop by, we give them 10, 10 tokens, and they're asked to put those tokens in canisters. We just let them know that there's 10 tokens that represent property taxes, money, and there's six different categories of city spending, and they can put them all in one, or they can split them out um, the way that they would like to show uh, their priorities for the council. And then we also always have um, a free form um, a page, a, like a poster set up, where they can uh, write comments to the, to the council as well. And those have been updated and are published in, your, um, in the public council agenda materials. For you to see, there's um, we had a lot, lot of input, and um, as we've stated before, and I want to continue to state that we know that these results are not uh, statistically scientific. Um, just, however, it has been a great education tool for the public when we're out in the community, and just a way to encourage um, the public to share their priorities with us, and also an education tool, and, and so that. Um, public can, can see what we're spending money on and then they can let us know what their priorities are. So one thing that's changed since the last time as far as the in-person engagement is um, the the number three rule. So like it's still the first one that we, the highest amount of chips that we've had in, in the categories for, for parks, arts, recreation, natural resources, followed closely by public safety. But it went from facilities and infrastructure to healthy community after we had the On the One Music Festival. Um, so that was just, there was a lot of support for that category at that event, so that was interesting. And then along with in person, oh, I went to, oh, I'm sorry. I was, I needed to be more patient. Uh, we have our virtual option as well. And so we have a few more responses uh, from the last time we shared this. And that's also, this is, the comments are also in the 
in the agenda packet materials, there's 175 written responses. But um, in addition to those in-person interactions, 268 residents have filled out the priority-related survey on the Let's Talk Bloomington site. Um, and as I said, the last time we shared those results, um, they were in the exact same order as the in-person totals, but now they're a little different in that online, it's public safety is ranked as the highest because they rank them from one through six. Um, and then, um, oh, that's changed actually. So uh, yeah, so public safety is a little higher and then uh, parks is second and then facilities is third. So a little bit different. So that's public engagement. And then factors affecting the budget request. Um, just another uh, review of our, the lodging tax revenues and highlighted in red there is the amount that was in 2020 during the pandemic and how much that fell from 2019. But that you see for 2024, we are projecting that to come almost back up to where we were. And then uh, mission tax revenues have um, went way down in 2020, of course, but have surpassed where we were in 2019. They're doing very well. And um, unfortunately, we don't have that same story for our permit revenues. Um, that would really help with our budget balancing a lot. But uh, we had some really high years for permit revenues in 22 and um, in previous and also in uh, 23. But for the 2024 budget, um, it's projected to be lower than what we've seen. So we will continue to monitor this as we go through uh, this year and we get closer um, to proposing the final tax levy. Um, but right now, these are what the revenue projections look like. So moving over to um, expenses. On the expense side, um, as I had said before, there are three significant issues that are driving city expenses next year. And the first is the labor market pressure. Um, unemployment in Minnesota is at a record low rate, and competitive salaries and benefits are needed to attract and retain skilled personnel. Um, second expense driver is, you know, Bloomington's continued commitment to public safety. So that proposal to add six new firefighters is in this 2024 budget um, to help with the ongoing transition to a hybrid part-time and full-time department for, for fire department, as well as adding another dispatcher in the dispatch center is also a cost driver. And um, that, and then another cost driver is just the economic volatility affecting costs of materials and services, which is not just unique to Bloomington, but um, to other city governments and businesses and individuals are experiencing that as well. So here's just a reminder of what was done in 2023, so, um, and also what we're proposing in 24. So in 23, 21 full-time firefighters were added to the fire department. 18 of those are, were funded from a the federal SAFER grant. And then um, and then three were, came from the, the general fund budget. And then um, in 23 as well, four new police officers were added as well as a new dispatch training coordinator. So um, in addition to that, continuing with this investment in public safety for 24 budget, we have uh, six full-time firefighters and then a new dispatcher. And so this next slide just has the 2024 staffing changes. So the two I just talked about with firefighters and dispatch. But then also wanted to mention um, for parks and recreation, these are not new staffing positions, but an, in, um, a reclass of a proposed reclass of three staff positions from part time to full time in order for them to be able to um, do more. And um, address uh, service needs that are very much needed in parks and recreation. Okay, so this uh, preliminary budget request, um, as we looked at it before, this results in a 9.49% increase from 2023, and that would translate into a 5.65% tax increase for the median value home. And that equates to $6.28 more a month um, for 2024. 
So as I said before, the 2024 preliminary levy sets the maximum amount that the city can collect in property taxes for next year. And the council can lower that number in December 4th. Uh, but once this preliminary levy is set and submitted to Hennepin County, it can't raise above that. Um, I want to say too that in October and November there will be department budget presentations that are in depth in all of these different areas. Um, so as you get closer to setting that final tax levy and budget. So this before I talked about what a 9.49 percent tax levy increase, how that would impact the median value home. Um, by month, so in the month, there it is in the middle. So right now it's at $111.09 a month. It would go up $6.28. But if you wanted to see that like on a weekly basis or an annual basis, so an annual basis, that would be $75.34 for the median value home. And um, when we were discussing the budget last month, um, we talked about like not just the median value home for the entire city, but just a request to kind of see how maybe that plays out differently across the city. So I reached out um, to our assessing division, and if you recognize the way that the city is split up on this slide, these are the assessing quintiles. So the city's divided in five different areas, and um, they use that in order to do a, a deep dive uh, assessment of homes in each one of those quintiles. So this is looking at it more um, in each of those separate sections and uh, the median value home in those sections. So it's not just to show like when we talk about the median value home, it does change across you know the city. So um, over on the west, for example, it's $13.69 per month more with a 9.49% tax levy for that median value home. And then you can see, um, just going across the top there, $7.43 a month more, $4.44, $7.36, and then down south, uh, $9.95. So just kind of another way to, to look at that other than just the median value home for the entire city. And then another slide uh, we've added is that comparison slide. So a lot of cities just like us, they're, they're doing this right now at their council meetings and they're... Um, the councils are setting their preliminary tax levy. So this is the 2023 because we have those numbers. Um, but just to show you where we are currently in 2023 compared to other cities. So this is the median value home per month that it's in red there from Bloomington at $111.09. And just kind of where we fall in um, these other cities that we compare ourselves to that are either in Hennepin County or they're else um, a similar um, size as us and comparable. And uh, just another kind of different way, like sometimes with a lot of numbers, um, it's hard to get a sense of how the, the whole uh, property tax levy is being allocated. So we like to do it. Um, we, will, we usually use something like this when we send out the notice that goes in the truth and taxation um, that not notice in November. So um, you can see a, a majority um, of property taxes are going to public safety with police and fire is about half. So if you this is this is representing like one dollar property city property taxes, and then um, the next biggest amount is seventeen cents would be for public works, and then fourteen cents for parks and recreation. I want to note when we're looking if we were to look at this for the twenty twenty three property tax. Um, it would be much larger for public works compared to parks and recreation because we have shifted uh, a number of employees in our park maintenance division into parks and recreation. So now the, the public works and the parks and recreation allocation are more similar. So um, that's one thing that's changed. And then seven cents for community development, six cents for community services, and then six cents for capital debt. Um, these are kind of review slides, these first two. Um, just wanted to show these again. So this is a way where we take the increase in the property tax levy, the, the net of everything, and we're allocating them out across those service departments. So, you know, finance, um, administ uh, city manager, those are getting allocated within these, but these are the public facing. You know, this is why we do what we do for, you know, the, the public services. 
and how much of this tax, property tax increase, um, how much is changing for each department. And so one of the big things that I've gone back and put an asterisk and a note, because it, I think what will jump out to you is that parks and recreation is going up a lot and public works is going down a lot. And that, again, is just another way where that shift of the park maintenance division from public works to parks and recreation is impacting this. Just a um, different way of how we're managing that. And then again, um, same slide that we looked at before, but also with a, a, just a little footnote there too, where we're breaking it out by uh, salaries, internal charges, material supplies and services, and debt. And I think I mentioned before a lot, you know, salaries and benefits is a big part of the city's budget just by the nature of who we are and what we do. And um, just wanted to point out that that 5.3% does not mean that everyone's getting a 5.3% salary increase. That um, along with the pay increases, it also has some proposed additional staffing as well as uh, changes for benefits. And then this is uh, another slide that wasn't there here before. Just another way to try to uh, analyze this is this is, again is the tax, the proposed tax levy increase changing from 23. And that first, the current level services, that's sort of like looking at a, a bait, like the base budget with the staffing that we had, internal service charges, and just what that would look like. And that's a 6.2% increase. And then with the new staff we're proposing, most of that is the firefighters. Um, and then the new operating expense, that's not necessarily new things that we're doing, but it's um, when the when the departments are putting in their budget requests, like what things are costing as far as um, the request that they're putting in that's not already preloaded for salaries and benefits or for like, internal um, charges. And then the, again, that debt service amount making up the difference. So my um, last slide here, I'm just gonna show the budget calendar. Um, so here we are in uh, September at the preliminary levy. And so, as I just mentioned a little bit earlier, things that are going to be coming up is we're going to have a lot, of, not me talking, it's going to be, you're going to be hearing directly from the departments and diving into their budget. So um, October 9th, police and fire will be presenting. October 16th, parks and recreation, public works, and community services will be presenting. And that will also be the night we'll, we'll present uh, proposals for utility rate rates for 2024. And then uh, we have planned for October 30th, um, Lori Economy Scholler, she'll be going over the CIP, as well as uh, have a chance to have a discussion about the Strategic Priorities Fund. And then November 13th will be the IT department, community development, and legal uh, presenting their budgets. And then that'll bring us to November 20th, which is again a special budget meeting um, where you'll be kind of focused in on where you want that final 2024 tax levy and budget. And then December 4th is the truth and taxation public hearing that will be noticed. So that is the end of my slides. Thank you very much. Council questions, comments? Councilmember Dalisandro. Thank you, Mr. I talked you into it by looking at you long enough, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm always impressed when, uh, when Kari, you come up here and give us the information because <laughs> it's, it's a lot. And I know that there's just reams and reams of data underneath the stuff that you present to us that you probably have in your brain. We could never do that. And that's, uh, that's a kudos to you on that. Could, would I, uh, I did have a I wanted to go back to um, the two. I, I appreciated that you sent uh, you you showed those two ways of looking at the the budget data. The first one I think was um, more on at a department level, and then the second one was on kind of like continuation of services versus new ad. Oh, um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, you could leave it here for now. So a couple of questions here. Um, you you said that the majority of that new staff is our firefighters. Can you give me an approximate understanding? Is it eighty percent? Is it fifty percent? It's um, like ninety percent, eighty percent. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay, it's north of seventy five. Yeah. No, yes. Okay, great. Uh, that's helpful. So, um, are 
if you could give me a, maybe a, a, an example of the new operating expense line items here um, to understand. So maintaining a current level of service implies that um, we can continue to do things exactly as we're doing them. But the way that you describe new operating expense, it made it sound like like stuff's costing more. So maybe if we didn't do them, we wouldn't be able to maintain our current level of service. So I just want to make sure I understand if, if you have a, a good example you can give me to kind of articulate what the difference between it, maintaining a current level of service versus these new operating expenses. Yes, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, that, that is a very good point. That is, it it is the same level of service, but with just because of what things cost, increased costs. So the way our general ledger and budget is structured, we, I don't have a, an easy way of um, breaking that out from all of the proposals. So we were just trying to, based on how everything is submitted for the budget, it, it's easy to break out the salaries, what the salaries and benefits cost and the internal allocations and and segregate that and it's easy to segregate the new staff ads it's um and then i'm able to take we call them the discretionary budget amounts and that's really the only amounts that the um that the departments can um you know request or add to or change and so that's that by itself so within there is maybe a little both like there might be some things in there where they're requesting a, some new services or um, maybe a, a study that they would like to do this is um you know and just in the general fund but then a, a lot of it is also just the utility costs are going up or the cost of salt is increasing or things like that so we can maybe try to break that up a little bit more but um as far as an easy way to, to s extract that out and present it. Yeah. Um, that's well, how we've got it here. So it's kind of our first try of trying to do it like this. Sure. No, I, I think it's a really interesting way of looking at it. So, it, you know, at a very first blush, I would say, okay, what you're telling me here is in order to maintain the current level of service that we have, we need to add, we need to, we need to get 6.2% more dollars in there because of stuff costing more, right? Or, whatever it is. And I, and I get that. So that's easy. And I, you know, new staff, we can talk about what those are, but 90% is, or so our firefighters, we knew that was coming. Um, it, it's in that 1.59% that I'd really love a little bit more detail because what I care about is I talk to, when I talk to our residents, oftentimes what I say to them is I know no, nobody likes to be charged tax levy. Like I'm a homeowner. I don't like it either. Right. Okay. But if we're going to do it, are we sure that we're doing it against the things that our residents have told us are the priorities? Mm -hmm. So when I look at that 1.59%, I want to know that in order, like you've mentioned, you know, public safety, parks and rec, and, you know, public services or whatever we called it, uh, infrastructure, those are the three big ones. Against that, I would expect to see that being the lion's share of those new operating expenses because that's in alignment with our with the priorities that our residents have shared with us. I don't know if we can get there, but if we could get there, I think that would be a really helpful way for me to understand that number, um, because I don't I don't want it to be something different than those things unless we have talked about it up here as a council and we can say, yeah, we we've heard what you said, residents, but we think that this is also important and so we're going to fund this anyway, even though it didn't show up on your radar as a strategic priority for you as a, as a resident. Um, that's a harder conversation to have, but I'd like to have that eyes wide open, I guess. is So I don't know if I'm asking for too much, but if that $1.1 .1 can kind of get broken down against your, your, your um, buckets – from your from your um, your community conversations to understand what that would be, I think it'd be a really helpful way to look at that. Yes, um, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Del Center, we can do we can definitely do that, and it might also be part of our in depth department presentations as well. So we're doing each of those departments. We can share that too. Okay, what part of that is theirs? Great, thank you. Thanks. Council, additional questions, comments. Council Member Loman. Yeah, if we could uh, go back to slide 15. Um. 
I can't see the numbers. Or wait, yes, I can. It's the slide where you uh, looked at residential assessment oh. review area. Yeah, that one right there. So with with this one here, I know that um, Councilmember Nelson and I kind of had a similar question um, with regard to this. And the, and the thing that I just want to make sure that I understand this right. So for that quadrant there, are we just looking at the median income? So like that 9.1 over there? Because um, what I'm really interested in, and I don't know if there's a way to even do this, is when you get down back behind the, the median income folks, because when you get into that, if let's say we we took the you know the first quartile of people, you know that's where we saw the biggest increases, mm -hmm. and that was not shown uh, in our last um, when we did our last levy increase, uh, and that was what I kept hearing as knocking on the doors. Hey, you know, I know you're talking about this median income increase, but my you know stuff is going up 12, 13, 14, you know, 20 percent. And it's just not reflected here. And so I just wanted to understand the impact. Not that it's going to change, you know, what this body does um, for those folks because there's not much we can do with, with you know, having a, you know, having this the style of taxation that we have. But I just think it's more indicative of what uh, what what they're going to experience um, um, as their um, – and so I don't know if that's even possible to do that. I know that's why we stick with the median, and every time we get off that median – it, it can be a, uh, it can be a really crazy <laughs> exercise. So I'm not looking for a big, huge thing, but if there was maybe we could take maybe just one of these segments and just look at a few, um, mm -hmm. uh, like a scattered uh, plot of a couple of, you know, different uh, uh, folks that are median income that falls below that that number to see what their impact would be uh, or what they've experienced in the past. Is that making sense what I'm asking here? Yes, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, we can do that. Okay. Is it just? I think it's, it is just a little easier for for folks to have a better understanding of, of what what that impact may be. You know, that we we have the median, we have above that. You're gonna, you know, people are gonna experience things that are higher than that and that kind of thing. But I just think it's a, you know, that we have at least have that that look to kind of see as we're looking at this. Councilmember D'Alessandro, you have a question? I, I have a, a clarification request for Councilmember Lohman. You've said median income, but this is medium home value, so this is property value, not income. Yeah, so sorry. I, I just want to make sure. We, I, I think we're talking the same thing here. I, I, I said the wrong thing. Sorry, I'm very tired with the new baby. So. <laughs> no, no, I, I, just, I, I wanted to be sure because yeah, I actually I don't disagree that that's a good uh, idea, but I wanted to be sure that we were talking about the same numbers. That's all. Yeah, I think we're talking the same numbers, right? We're, you understood me to, even though I didn't say that. You understand that, right? <laughs> what I'm asking? Yes. Are you, are yes, you, are, I was assuming you uh, wanted the median value, the lower. There you go. Yeah. And the median value home, some scattered uh, lower value homes in those areas across the city. To what kind of impact this tax levy increase would have on those homes? Yeah. And maybe there's nothing. Maybe it's bigger. I don't know. Well, I'd just be interested to see that. And I have one other question for you. I know in 2023, uh, we did do um, an increase uh, for the police department because we looked at across. Um, uh, multiple jurisdictions uh, to see that we are, you know, falling behind in our ranks uh, with how many um, uh, police officers that we have. And I noticed that uh, for this year we don't have uh, any um, increase to that uh, that group as a part of the, the request. And I was curious why uh, there isn't an increase um, to, to keep with, you know, keep up with that or increase the ranks of our, our police department. Mayor, council members, council member Lohman. So I haven't highlighted out the, you know, we have budgeted increases, um, kind of forecasted increases for salaries and benefits across the city. And you know, police are have three different uh, unions within their um, department. So they're in contract negotiations, but um, for the 24 um, contract, but I haven't... Um, broken out what we've budgeted, you know, specifically, um, as far as any of the information, it's all part of like the salaries all grouped together. Okay. So, the, so there is new, uh, officers being proposed for 2024. There's, oh, I'm sorry. No, there's, we don't have new pol police officers in this budget. The and that's the question I have. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's is, for manager question. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if the manager is still, uh, even, is he still around or is he gone? No. And, and I think the, the uh, Mr. Verbrugge can jump on here, but I think the general answer is that 
after adding four last year, four new officers last year for the first time in the decade to add officers to the Bloomington Police Department, uh, the I think the assumption and the understanding was they've they've forced up for a while. They've got the they're, they're looking now at dispatchers to increase the efficiency of what they've got there. But um, the, my understanding is that with that's what Chief Hodges is looking at now in terms of full full uh, full force for now. Whether that changes in the future, that could be you know there could be an additional request. But um, it, the way he brought forward the budget request to the to the city manager that's what he was where he needed to be at this time okay so that's that's really mr mayor council yep. members council member Loman, if i may jump in uh mayor's uh, summary is is accurate i would say that we are looking at some different uh police staffing options that we'll be discussing when we have the police and fire um, budget conversation with the city council in october uh but the the staffing options that we're looking at are likely ones that are going to not affect the levy uh, and will relate to the uh, public safety funding that is coming from the state of Minnesota and possibly some other sources. So we can discuss uh, the, the staffing issues uh, when we have that budget come forward. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I know that uh, from the conversation that we had last year, and when the, the chief, I hadn't heard that there had been a change in that. So that's why I was concerned that uh, I didn't see any increase that, you know, had something had changed, um, you know, what had happened with that. And I appreciate the mayor and the managers uh, um, uh, that they were going to try to get at that in a different way, which I certainly appreciate that. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This might be along the same lines, and maybe this is what you were answering um, uh, before, but... Um, so if you go to slide 18, um, so you have the tax levy increase by department. And so with police, it's a, the percent change from 2023 is 2.5%, 2.56%. Fire is 2.1. So fire, we're hiring six positions. So I understand that. And for police, there was one dispatcher, but that's, it's kind of, it, it just kind of jumps out to me as a pretty substantial increase with one new staff like a bigger increase than fire is seeing with six new staff. So I don't know if you could have the information to be able to talk through that increase of like, what does that actually mean? Like, what does that entail? So mayor, council members, council member Carter, I can dig into that to get some more details on there, but just um, thinking through what is in that police budget. Um, the police department is one of the, the departments that have um, a lot of employees, so just um, the amount. So it's not that it's necessarily a 2.56% um, um, increase overall in the police budget, but like taking the amount, because not everything in the general fund is funded by property taxes, but, um, but even um, just the salary increase for the existing staff that they have, it's a significant amount in the budget. So um, that's what I believe is driving that, but I can get the details of that, yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions? I just wanted, uh, looking at the, the other staffing increase the, in the park department, park and rec, Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that two of the uh, movements from part-time to full-time, they're, they're cost-neutral based on cost reductions. And um, uh, I, I think in, in doing a little digging and having conversations, I understand that the other a new position is actually an add back from a position that was cut back in 2021 or, or so. And it was something we had said in the past, that we weren't simply – in the most case, most cases, we weren't just adding back staff that we had cut during the the austere times of during the pandemic. We weren't simply doing that, but in this case, we are, and it's specifically for programming at Creekside Community Center for for senior programming. And uh, again, as we talk about a budget that reflects the values and the priorities of this community, programming, staffing, doing what we can for our seniors at Creekside Community Center kind of fits that bill very nicely and I and I understand because people may point and say no you said you've said all along that you weren't simply adding back staff that you cut back in 2020 
in this case we are, but it's for a specific need and it's for the need at Creekside Community Center for our, our, our senior programming there. Did I summarize that correctly? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I'll, I will also add that making that position full-time allows Parks and Recreation to be able to offer more programming that was identified in the Park System Master Plan as areas of improvement that they heard. So this is in a response to that as well. Very good. Thank you. Councilmember Lohman? Mayor, to that, that point, um, I'm curious about the part-time, full-time. My understanding was that in, in past years, um, I thought we had made a change where we made um, – uh, health care available to part-time uh, employees is, is that that's something that uh, did that happen is that ongoing is that available to all of our part-time employees um, or is that have any impact at all to these moves um, or, or other moves <laughs> that may be made in the, in the future so mayor council members council member Loman uh, for part-time employees, they um, do not have health insurance unless they work over a certain number of hours and required to offer health insurance. So there's only a couple that fit that. Um, what we have changed in more recent years is offering paid time off uh, for part-time employees. So that, that that was a benefit that was added. Um, we see that in the accrued benefits fund where we have to accrue the paid time off. Part of that now is growing because all of part-time employees um, do are able to accrue time um, and have paid time off. So what's the cutoff that we have for, is, does it have to do with the uh, Affordable Care Act when the cutoff is for that? So if you're beneath that, then we don't have to cover you. Um, is, is that what we're seeing other cities are doing in this, this kind of environment too as well? is kind of sticking to that because I know there's a significant impact to the levy if we say hey, we're going to provide health care for <laughs> employees so I'm not um, and I, I thank you for reminding me it was PTO I couldn't remember what the benefit was that we had provided uh, uh, for folks um, is, is that uh, mayor members um, council member Lohman that is something I will need to research with our HR yeah. department uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor and council members council member Lohman for the, you're, you're right about the Affordable Care Act that uh, any employee working 30 hours or more uh, on a consistent basis uh, has to be offered insurance. Um, and that's the, that's the practice that we have as well. And, and, and given that we've, we've talked about equity and inclusion, I, I am curious about the demographics of, of those folks that fall underneath uh, that, uh, you know, are not provided that and what those look like. I'm just curious to see what, um, you know, what the age, you know, what the, the makeup of those folks, if that's, if that's something we could, we could see as a breakout. And I'm curious about that as well, council member, but I think we need to focus a bit here on the, uh, on, on the levy and the budget. And I understand this, it does have levy and budget implications. I understand. Thank you. I don't want, because I'm going to take you to task on that. that if you say there's not. <laughs> no, but, you, I, appreciate uh, that. I don't necessarily, uh, I, I think, that's that's a broader discussion than what we're having. Yeah, and I, the reason why the only reason why I asked that question is, you know, based on what what you said about you know this idea, this paradigm around you know the equity uh, piece of it uh, that you asked earlier. So, um, uh, as a part of this this piece, that's the only reason why I asked that question. So, I just wanted to get more clarity on that piece. So, I'm, I'm finally leaving it right there. Something for 2025. Thank you, Councilmember Carter. And then we'll get to our public hearing on this. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, last time when we had uh, kind of our preliminary discussion, uh, Mr. Verbrugge shared what he was hearing other cities were coming in at for their preliminary levy. Um, but I think they it was very preliminary, and so I guess I'm curious if he has any updated information on where other cities are at. I know cities across the metro, and I'm sure the state, are dealing with similar issues that we're dealing with and, and seeing kind of these uh, historically high levy um, numbers. And so... I'm curious if there's any update to those. I think that's a good question, Councilmember Carter. And looking at this, uh, this is a useful uh, chart here about the final property tax comparison of the median value homes per month. But I think, yeah, specifically what the percentage increases for each of these cities is or, or is proposed to be would be helpful as well. Mr. Verbrugge, do you have that information? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Carter. <clears throat> Unless uh, Kari was able to do some quick research in the last couple of days, all of the cities are certifying their preliminary levy amounts right about the same time we are last week and this week. And so we don't have what their uh, certified number is 
and probably won't have that until the end of this month. We'll certainly share it with the council as we go through the um, uh, budget process. I have not heard uh, from any of my colleagues that they are adjusting the numbers uh, differently than what I shared previously. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Ms. Carlson, is there anything else in the presentation? Uh, no, uh, Mayor, Council Members, that's all I had. Just to say, this it's actually not a public hearing tonight. Um, we'll just do we'll do the public hearing on December fourth for the Truth and Taxation. Uh, but this is just um, the council setting the preliminary levy in. My mistake. Thank you for General the correction of that. It is not a uh, a public hearing tonight. It is just the motion to approve the two uh, items: the preliminary tax levy and the general fund budget. And then we'll have the public hearing at another time. Council, any additional discussion? If not, Council, uh, I would look for action on item 4.1, the resolution adopting the preliminary 2024 tax levy. Councilmember D'Alessandro. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, um, <clears throat> um, is there, uh, I'd, I'd like to just get have a discussion about whether or not we think that number is the right number to start with if that's okay just because of where we're at um and i asked that question largely because of that 1.5 percent that's that's kind of out there that i don't know anything about and i feel a little like i'm not sure what we're adding to that pile um so i i you know i my my initial thought about a preliminary levy number is like it could be 50,000 for all I care because it's a maximum and therefore we could do what we need to do in truth and taxation, right? So I'm not super wedded to making a case for it except to, to try to say like we as a council are uncomfortable with that number being even on the table. And so um, I don't know where other folks are at with it. Um, you know, I, I know last last year when we did this, we started at a really big number and it came down twice or three times even by the time we were passing the levy. If I remember, it was in the 11s and then by the time we did it, it was nine, right? Something like that. Um, so um, I assume that we're going to probably try to bring this down. I would certainly hope that we do. Um, there's an open question in my mind about whether or not we should set something tonight that is indicative of where we all have a tolerance for a maximum. And this one's a little high for me. I, I just think we should show residents and we should help residents understand that um, we are uh, we are we are continuing to um, work to provide the most efficient set of services that we can. And um, it's been hard on everyone. Um, there are lots of folks in our in our um, neighborhoods who struggle, uh, you know, to support their families. And um, we're trying all kinds of ideas. <laughs> and one of them would be that we, you know, um, force an issue where it's like, hey, some of this stuff that you want to do that's maybe newer or more experimental or should be something that we, you know, do now but move into our budget over time or whatever, those things should be maybe found, funded with grants or other mechanisms as opposed to through the property tax. I just don't know if that 1.59% there is um, is related to stuff that's aligned with our strategic priority at this point. And that's what makes me uncomfortable about saying, go ahead and put it in there. So I'm not suggesting necessarily that we come back with what I oh, – 1.5. 7.99 is the maximum number. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but I'm wondering if we should make a consideration here that this number is a little lower as a starting point. Well, and I'm thinking like 9%, 8.5%. I, I, I think you might be doing the math just a bit wrong. So even Awesome. If, Great. Even I love that we, when I do that. Even if we were to limit <laughs> Sorry about that, that entire line item of new operating expense, that $1.1 $1 .1 million, that would, not, that would lower the, pro, the, the levy by... A point... A one, point and a half, one, right? Not, I don't think even a point and a half. I thought six hundred and fifty thousand was about a. Maybe that's point. about right. Yeah. yeah. So, Kurt, can you put that slide back up? Sorry. One that has the. Good evening. And Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Alessandro, you're asking about the new operating. Yep. In the other direction, Kari. One. One more. There you go. There you go. Yes, correct. 
the, the, the math I was doing was to say, like, if we if we really truly were trying to um, maintain, you know, essentially what we have, understanding that we need to fund those new firefighters, et cetera, um, would we be able to say without that 1.59%, we would be more in the 7.99 number for the for the for the levy cuz i believe that 9.49% is our levy increase number so i was taking that 1.5% out of that number is what i was doing so i don't know if, mr mayor if that's the right math but but that but that was an open question really i, I, like, I see what you're saying now. yeah yep i don't know what's in that number so i'm hesitant to just say yeah sure go ahead with that number but also i understand some of it will probably be there which is why i'm maybe putting on the table maybe 9% as a number um I don't know. I'm throwing out something for discussion, if you will. Council, discussion? Council Member Moore? Thank you, Mayor. I think in that same vein, Council Member D'Alessandro, um, I would be hesitant because we don't know what's in that number to drop it down mm -hmm. and then tie our hands to, to be able to meet the strategic priorities that the residents of Bloomington would want. Um, this is not a number that I'm comfortable with, but I truly believe it's a number we can work on. Um, and it's not what we saw a few years back where we were in the 11s, double digits. Mm -hmm. And so um, kind of along the same vein, I'm just taking the other approach to it. Okay. Other in opinions on that? Other thoughts? Council Member Lohman? I kind of like the idea. Well, we don't, we don't put, put our staff on the, on, on the hot seat tonight <laughs> and see what we can uh, trim off, you know, if we could trim it down to nine or, you know, down to eight, you know, uh, figure out what that, what that means. Because the question I, I have when I looked at this is, gosh, you know, 6.2 plus the one, that gets you 7.26. Um, what would happen if we lop that, you know, what, what's the impact there? You know, I, I heard you say something about the salt fee increasing. So then how would we cover that salt increase if it was locked off at the, you know, at the, um, at the 7.26, let's say, I mean, so that, that this, I mean, that, I'm trying to figure out what's in that, that number and what the impact would be, uh, to, to services if we, if we, if we lop that, that piece off. But no, I'm council members. Rather than going the route of putting staff on the hot seat at this moment and try to figure out what numbers should be, my recommendation would be to pass the 9.49, and then the discussions that we're going to have over the next six weeks, where we're going to see detailed budget presentations from each of the departments. That's the time. That's the time. That's the opportunity to say there might be an opportunity to, to reduce some funding. There might be an opportunity to cut do cuts there. But to stand here without knowing what that number is, one way or another. And to say, nope, take that out, and we'll work around it, we'll figure a way around it, I think would be um, irresponsible. As we learn more about it and we decide we don't like it, that, that, that's a possibility. But to do it without more information, without having those detailed budget presentations by the different departments here at the city, uh, I think that's, that's not the way to go. Councilmember Carter? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do agree with you. Uh, I would ask when staff... Uh, bring back the department budgets and we have those thorough conversations, you know, I would be interested to know, you know, what has been considered on the list of maybe we just need to stop doing these things. How do we work more f efficiently in some areas? Are there other options for the way we administer services that might be cheaper or less expensive but not compromise quality? Um, and then what are other potential revenue streams that have been considered? Um, I think that we often talk about like what's coming off the list and I know that staff are having those conversations but we don't always hear them and I do think it's important when we have a second year in a row with a pretty high levy for our community to understand that you know staff is being diligent they're looking for ways to curb costs um, at every angle and so um, I also believe that we can't cut our way to a lower budget. So I'm um, thinking through the revenue streams and um, different ways of administering services. Um, and again, maybe it's staff does the analysis and there really aren't a lot of options and, and it is what it is, but uh, just to know that the conversations are happening um, for uh, for our sake and for the community's sake. Council Member Lohman. You know, and to, you know, basically what Mua, uh, Council Member Mua has, has uh, brought forward, I'm curious about what 20, you know, 2025, you know, those, those, those out years. So for example, we have these new firefighters 
uh, you know, where are we building that in when we make the transition? You know, what what impact is that going to have on, on future years? So, um, uh, so what isn't in here that's in the future that we should be thinking about as a as a policy making body that would make us say, hey, maybe we ought to keep it at nine point four nine. Let's reserve those dollars so that we can can be able to spend those dollars in the in the future. You know, and that's the way I would I would look at this in in the same way if we're, we're going to look at that. So I'm perfectly fine going with with nine point four nine tonight, but I'd also like to look at the future stuff so that we don't get hit in the future years with you know additional you know department changes, other types of things that are going to happen in the and, and you know we've got this thing artificially low uh, for this year because we're you know our names happen to be on the ballot, so we want to keep it low this year, and then next year we're going to raise it. So um, just just a thought. So. So, Council, additional thoughts? Are we comfortable moving forward with a 9.49, understanding that the staff is going to come back with some detailed budget presentations, uh, going to continue to take out the sharp pencils, as they always do, and, uh, and if we see things in those budget presentations that we would consider to be opportunities for reductions in this levy, that we'd bring them forward and we'd have that discussion at that time. People comfortable with that? Councilmember Loman. That's the case. I'm happy to go ahead and move this resolution here. Councilmember Loman. Mayor, I move to a resolution establishing the preliminary 2024 tax levy increase of 9.49%. Second. Motion by Councilmember Loman, second by Councilmember Mua to adopt the resolution establishing the preliminary 2024 tax levy increase of 9.49%. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Most motion carries 6-0. Uh, item 4.2, which goes hand in hand with that, is of course the preliminary 2024 general fund budget. Okay. Councilmember Lohman. Be happy to move that. I move to establish a preliminary 2024 general fund budget utilizing the 9.49 levy increase. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mula to adopt the resolution establishing uh, preliminary 2024 general fund budget utilizing the 9.49 levy increase. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. We'll be seeing a lot more of you, I know, in the next six weeks or so. Yes. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Up next, our series of public hearings regarding our assessments. And this is an annual thing that we do. And I think if, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe we're gonna have the presentation and then we'll have the individual public hearings on each of these items and we'll work our way through them one by one. Is that correct? Yep, Very that, good. Is, that is correct. Um, and I am Amy Stevig. I'm also um, the other deputy finance officer in the finance department um, standing in for Lori um, tonight who's joining us um, on the phone, so. And um, I, so good evening, Mayor and Council Members. As um, the Mayor mentioned, I will begin with a general overview for each of these um, five types of assessments. And then at the end, there will be motions for each separate one. So this slide reflects the timeline of the requirements of the assessment process. The legal notice was published in the Sun Current, um, as you can see, on August 24th, and then a week later, uh, the administrative hearing took place where four property owners attended the hearing, and those were all for civil fines. Here are the five categories of assessments. They have remained the same from past years public nuisance, tree removal, weed and brush removal, delinquent utilities, and civil fines are the five types. Now keep in mind on the graphs in the next few slides, those, these numbers actually reflect um, the amounts as of the date of the Sun Current publication. So they continue to be paid off and um, you know continue to decrease over time, but at this 
um, the graphs were created based on that um, point in time with the Sun Current publication amounts. Um, the assessment totals um, for the last five years are reflected on this graph, um, excluding delinquent utilities, just simply because given a, their large dollar amount, the graph would be unreadable. Um, as you will notice, the tree removal amounts have grown significantly in the last couple of years. And of course, this reflects the impact of emerald ash borer on trees in our community. Delinquent utilities are reflected on this graph, unlike the um, previous one, and shows the number of properties being assessed for utilities has grown slightly over the past three years. The number of properties are primarily residential with <clears throat> only 16 commercial properties being assessed this year. Public nuisance assessments have stayed within the same range for the past five years. And all 17 of these tree removal assessments qualify for the new program adopted this year in which the assessment can be paid over three, five, or 10 years. Um, these 17 assessments happen to qualify for the three-year assessment plan based on their amounts, which were all below $3,000. Weed and brush removal assessments have also um, stayed somewhat consistent. The amount of delinquent utilities has risen in the last three years and in a higher ratio than the rise in properties impacted. This can be attributed to a rise in utility rates and then also the additional charges for the organics program. This map is reflecting utilities, and it's um, showing that every census tract in Bloomington has some properties located within it that are being assessed for utilities. Last, lastly, the civil fines have fluctuated slightly in the last five years. It's reflected on this graph. And that's the end of my slides. Um, is there any questions? If not, um, we will move on to the public hearing section. Thank you. Council, any questions on any of the slides we saw? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, more so a question. Uh, you mentioned with the tree removals that we have some folks taking advantage of the, uh, were they proactive about those? Because I know we changed recently the the uh, ability for folks to have that assessed on their property in a more proactive way, as opposed to some of these which are assessed because there's delinquency over a period of time, right? So um, those 17 properties that, that took advantage of that, were that, was that like a proactive discussion with them about using that new um, feature that we have? Um, Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, um, I um, w was not actually involved in that process, but I do have um, like the information that was um, provided to me that had been had been shared with individuals as um, as they were ass assessed for those tree removals, and so whether it was them reaching out initially or. Um, or, or due to the um, information that they were provided from the city, I'm not sure in each situation, okay. but it can certainly reach out. No, that, that's okay. I just was kind of curious because that's a fairly new development for us. If, if, that, if that caught on like it did, that would be great, right? Because part of what we were trying to do is help make, make it possible for people to afford to do this kind of work over time. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? Very good. Let us move into the public hearings. So at this time, with the information that we have just heard, I will call item 4.3 on the agenda. This is our public hearing regarding a public nuisance abatement assessment. Anyone here in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.3, the public hearing on the public nuisance abatement, abatement assessment? Mr. Brillard, is there anyone on the phone? Good 
One moment, Mr. Mayor, I'll have to close the presentation to see if there is. Yeah, we do not have anyone on the phone. Last call for anyone in the chambers? Council seeing no one coming forward, no one on the phone looking to speak to item 4.3. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.3. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Mua, second by Council Member Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.3. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Council, any further discussion on item 4.3? If not, I would look for a motion to adopt the resolution adopting the assessment role for the public nuisance abatements. I guess I can do it. <laughs> I thought you were going to take it. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll move to adopt a resolution adopting uh, the assessment roles for public nuisance abatements. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to adopt the resolution adopting the assessment role for public nuisance abatements. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Can we move to the next one? Next on the agenda, I'll call item 4.4. This is a public hearing regarding the tree removal assessments. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.4? Mr. Brillert, do we have anyone on the phone wishing to speak to item 4.4 this evening? Uh, may Mayor, no one on the phone for this item. Last call for the public hearing on item 4.4 here in the council chambers. Council, no one coming forward, no one on the phone wishing to speak to item 4.4. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.4. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter to close the public hearing on item 4.4. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council, I look for a motion to adopt the resolution adopting the assessment role for delinquent tree removal costs. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter to adopt the resolution adopting the reassessment role for delinquent tree removal costs. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. I'll call the public, item, uh, the public hearing for item number 4.5 on tonight's agenda. This is regarding weed and brush removal assessments. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.5 this evening? Mr. Brillert, anyone on the phone yet? Mayor, no one on the phone. Last call. Council, no one on the phone, no one coming forward in the council chambers. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.5, weed and brush removal assessments. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.5. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council, I look for a motion to adopt a resolution adopting the assessment role for weed and brush removal costs. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to adopt the resolution adopting the assessment role for weed and brush removal costs. No further pub, uh, council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Item 4.6 on our agenda. This, too, is a public hearing regarding delinquent water, sewer, stormwater drainage, garbage recycling, and organics assessments. I will open the public hearing now and see if there's anyone in the chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.6. Mr. Brillard, is there anyone on the phone? Mayor, still no one on the phone. Last call on item 4.6. Council, I will look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.6 with no one coming forward in the chambers and no one on the phone. So moved. Motion by Council Member Mua, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.6. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Council, I would look for a resolution uh, look for a resolution to adopt the assessment role for delinquent water, sewer, stormwater drainage, garbage recycling, and organics assessments. So moved. Uh, uh, question, Councilmember Dallas. Sorry, yeah, before we yes. move it, if that's okay, sorry. That would be fine, thank I, I you. I appreciate you were on the roll. That was great. I was on the roll. Um, totally. Um, so I had a, a couple of quick questions about this one. Um, number, one, number one, it's huge. Like, it's always big. And I am concerned that there are underlying financial burdens on residents that we aren't necessarily trying to support here. Um, and I don't mean that as a as, like, we're not doing our jobs. I just mean that, like, Usually when you see this kind of swell of, like, challenges, um, of course there's always people who are like, no, I'll just assess it. I'd rather spend my bills that way or whatever. That's fine. Um, but there could be true hardship here, and I'm curious. We, we've asked a number of times um, 
about, um, you know, um, innovations in areas around utility billing, right? Um, I think one of the ideas that I've mentioned before here myself, you, others have mentioned it, but, but um, you know, can we, can we find a way to go to every other week billing for, or every other week pickup for garbage for certain folks? Um, I had the, there was a crazy idea uh, I had uh, at one point that I talked with city manager about that the staff was maybe even looking into, which was, could I round up my bill and like use that to offset somebody's bill who can't afford it, right? I love that idea. That's a really community oriented idea. You know, um, my two extra bucks, cause I, you know, it's 118 for me, 120, maybe that's not a burden for me, but maybe that $2 could go towards somebody's ab abatement. Um, maybe somebody who does not want to pay for organics uh, would actually use it if we could help them or whatever. So I'm just curious if, um, if we are between now and 2024 budget cycle, are we going to get information about this as part of what is coming back to us because we've been asking for asking it for for a while, and it sits at it, this is the largest thing that is delinquent in our in our budget, um, and so I'm just you know part of part of a way to make budgets work better is actually get your bills paid on time, <laughs> which includes revenue for us as on time, right? Every dollar that this isn't in there is not being set. We're not getting interest on it. We're not, you know, so um, I'm just wondering if, if, and I don't know if, if Jamie, ha uh, if, if the city manager has anything on it, but I'd love to know if we've got some innovations coming in with the, with the discussion around utility billing in the budget cycle for 2020. And, and I appreciate that council member D'Alessandro. And I think it is a discussion worth having. And I really do. Uh, I will say just shooting from the hip and without specifics, I think the lion's share of that number that you see is water. It, it is not organics collection. It's not recycling. It's water. And uh, that, that's the largest portion, I think, that makes up this bill. And so uh, then it becomes a matter of the equity of charging for water. I mean, the equity and the, and the, the appropriateness of charging for water, but then it doubles back to we have got a lot of water infrastructure that we got to pay for. And so, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complex issue, and it's a complex conversation that we have. But I do think it's worth at least thinking about different ways that we could possibly approach it. So, Mr. Verbrugge, additional thoughts on that? And Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, the Mayor is correct. A good portion of that is in our water utility. Uh, and uh, we have not lost the idea, Council Member D'Alessandro, of the roundup. Um, our our uh, folks in finance have had a lot of transition this year. We just haven't had the staffing uh, bandwidth to um, study that. So we can make sure that we're incorporating into the future work plan. I know that our CFO is. Uh, uh, still has it on the radar screen. And then finally, the um, uh, the idea about the every other week or some of those other approaches uh, is, I think, going to be uh, factored into the rate study uh, that's going on currently. Any other questions, Council Member? Oh, with that, on I can make one? the motion if you'd like. Uh, uh, I, I think there was a motion. I think Council Member Mua did make the motion. Oh, okay, we were in discussion. Yep, and we were in the discussion. Great. Um, so it was appropriate. Did we get a second? I can second it. I think Councilmember D'Alessandro just seconded it. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Adi additional there. questions on this one? Additional discussion? Very good. We have a motion and a second to adopt the resolution adopting the assessment role for delinquent water, sewers, stormwater drainage, garbage recycling, and organics assessments. No further council discussion on this. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And the final one in our series here, this is a public hearing on item 4.7, I will call right now. This is a public hearing for civil fines for property-related violation assessments. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak on item 4.7 this evening? Mr. Brillard, anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor, nobody on the phone for this one. No one coming forward and no one on the phone. Council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.7. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Mua to close the public hearing on item 4.7. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. And Council, I would look for a motion to adopt a resolution adopting the assessment role for unpaid civil penalties and fines. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Mua to adopt the resolution adopting the re uh, assessment role for unpaid civil penalties and fines. Council discussion on this? Hearing none, Council, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 
six zero. Thank you, Ms. Evig, for setting us up with this and, and getting us through this. Council, thanks for working our way through that. And uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro, your questions are duly noted, and we'll work that, uh, make sure we bring that back to the staff one more time. We'll move on to item 4.8 on our agenda, so I can catch my breath and get a drink of water here. This is a, another public hearing. This is regarding the Lindale Avenue properties rezoning from B2 to B4. We've got Mr. Uh, Thomas Ramler Olson from our planning department here. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Good evening. Oh, that's it. Sorry. What? Ugh. Ugh. Sorry about that. All right. <laughs> Thank you, member, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Let me. Share my screen. Oh, perfect. Okay, that worked. All right. Uh, yes, so the item before you is the uh, proposed Lindale before rezonings. And that proposal consists of uh, rezoning a total of 28 parcels near the Lindale Avenue intersections with 86th Street and 98th Street. That's from B2 to B4. Um, if you recall, we discussed this, um, or this was brought as a study session on July 10th. And, went, um, and at that meeting, uh, a, a uh, resolution to uh, initiate the rezoning process was uh, adopted by by council on that date, and this is a, this is a public hearing to uh, continue that con discussion. These are the parcels under consideration. You'll see um, uh, on the left is the 86th Street node. That node is defined in the Lindale Avenue Suburban Retrofit Plan that was adopted in April of 2021. And on the right is the 98th Street uh, node, so all the parcels being considered are uh, concentrated around those two intersections. This is the land use. For uh, both areas, um, you'll see the general business is the guided land use for those parcels around 86th and Lindale. And then uh, for 98th Street Node, it's uh, uh, community commercial. Both guided land uses are, um, are, uh, uh, sorry, uh, are, um, are fine with the, uh, with the B4 zoning. Sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought. But anyways, there's no need, uh, sat, uh, staff's uh, interpretation that there's no need to re-guide those, uh, those properties proposed for rezoning. And that zoning is shown on this slide. You'll notice around the 80th Street, uh, the intersection of 86 and Lindale, the properties on the other side of Lindale are zoned transitional industrial. That was a previous zoning effort that was adopted back in January of this year. That one... Um, uh, that new zoning district transitional industrial also allows residential in you know under uh, specific circumstances and so really this effort is trying to mirror that um, that uh, initiative on both sides of Lindale in furtherance of the uh, suburban retrofit plan here's a, a table comparing the two zoning districts from B2 to B4 um, I've just highlighted some ones that stand out and that are um, that speak to the vision uh, illustrated in the uh, retrofit plan, um, looking at um, higher uh, floor area ratio under B4 if there's residential included in the development, uh, moving parking from, uh, uh, prohibiting parking in front of the building and moving it to the side or rear, um, window requirements along buildings, and a maximum actual uh, uh, front yard setback along uh, public streets. So again, all of those, Kind of continuing or um, emphasizing the uh, the design vision in the retrofit plan. Um, what was discussed before and is still at issue is um, or consideration is that some lots would become non-conforming with this rezoning. So just trying to keep that in mind. Um, uh, legal non-conformity is established when all the lot conditions have received all required approvals but they can continue. So there are some legal, or there will be some legal nonconformities that are created from the rezoning, but they are allowed to continue in their present state as long as they don't propose expansion, in which case um, then they would need to be brought into compliance with the uh, B4 zoning district. 
and here's an illustration of those lots that would uh, not be conforming with under uh, B4. It's There's four lots around 86 and Lindale and one lot uh, near the 98th Street node. Um, there's uh, The engagement for this process took or kicked off in early May. We sent letters, mailers, describing the project and how to engage with uh, staff planners about the project to all the property owners of the owners of the lots under consideration. Um, we also gave them a heads up that we would be vi visiting their property to make ourselves available to answer any questions and address any concerns they might have uh, with the proposed rezonings. Um, so we did visit those properties. We visited not only the properties, but each business if there were multiple tenants in each building. And so we visited each business. We handed them more information, uh, basically a redundancy of what was sent out in early May. And then we also um, handed out advertisements for the open houses later that month. There were two open houses. Um, throughout this process, we've received several phone calls and emails. Nothing really expressing objection or um, <laughs> or, or, um, or in opposition or, or, uh, pr uh, or uh, agreement with the, the proposal but just more or less inquiring about what are the specifics and what it would mean for their property, essentially. But yeah, uh, that's essentially it. And then uh, there were public hearings, or the, there was a public hearing uh, at the Public uh, Planning Commission back on August 17th. So that was kind of part, that can also be considered part of the engagement process. Um, at that uh, meeting, there you know, there were some concerns about legal nonconformities, um, potential for regarding guiding parcels, but I addressed that earlier. And uh, what are some of the current land uses um, of properties under consideration? Uh, staff also brought um, uh, a matter to the Planning Commission um, seeking guidance on perhaps exploring other rezonings along Lindale Avenue. There's been changing conditions between when the retrofit plan was adopted to now. Um, there's been more opportunities. There's also been some uh, residential development that's been success, or sorry, uh, I guess some of it is under construction uh, still, but other um, another development, uh, Lindale Flats has uh, been complete, but Oxborough Heights is currently under construction. So we've had some more activity along Lindale Avenue, and then there's some opportunities for redevelopment that have been that have, have appeared since then, and uh, they're currently zoned B2. So we went to the Planning Commission to seek guidance if there was any uh, interest in considering more rezonings um, uh, beyond what was uh, uh, prescribed in the re retrofit plan. And they did. Uh, there was uh, there was consensus to for staff to explore that. And we also come to you with that same question of um, what sort of guidance you have for staff to maybe explore additional rezonings. Um, so I mentioned uh, public correspondence. Again, just emails and phone calls asking about the parameters of the proposed rezonings. Um, there was a comment at the public hearing um, or at the uh, Planning Commission public hearing and it was from uh, representatives from Pawn America. Um, their pawn shops would be, they're currently allowed their conditional use within the B2 zoning district, but they're not uh, not allowed within B4. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when discussing legal nonconformities, they would be allowed to continue. Um, and there's some, there's uh, some manner in which they could continue, even if they proposed, uh, uh, you know, reconstruction. I mean, there would be you know, staff would work with them on that, but they wouldn't be allowed to expand. That would uh, uh, result in a larger footprint of their operations. And um, so they expressed some concern about the impact of rezoning on their property, on their business. Um, they've, uh, there was some expression of difficulty to contribute to the uh, revitalization of Lindale, something that they were interested in. Um, after that, staff reached out to the, um, to the representatives from Pond America, and we had a conversation with them address any concerns and, you know, what, what could they do to, um, uh, to be part of this revitalization of Lindale. So they did, um, provide a letter, um, proposing an amendment to the zoning code that was included in the council, uh, council packet that mentioned, um, or that proposed, uh, a new use within the B4 district, basically pawn shops, 
in existence um, at a certain date would be able to be a conditional use within the B4 district. That's what they're proposing. Um, this kind of ties in with the next steps uh, for this, um, if, they're, if the council wishes to pursue the next steps. So um, pending council direction, um, they're, there's a considering amending uh, the B4 use matrix to allow pawn shops as a conditional use uh, per the uh, proposed amendment from pawn, uh, the representatives from Pawn America. Uh, also, uh, study sessions before Planning Commission and City Council to reconsider or to consider additional rezonings along Lindale Avenue. Um, we'd also need to adopt a resolution to initiate those rezonings. And then, uh, in furtherance of that, uh, schedule of public hearings before Planning Commission and City Council. And then, um, just, uh, additional work, we just wanted to note that that would um, may include a Lindale Avenue corridor study. That's not. Um, uh, that's not part of the work plan, but that's something that staff is still uh, observing, and we are meeting regularly to uh, follow the progress of implementing the uh, retro or the uh, yeah the retrofit plan. So there's three recommendations before you tonight: um, uh, resolution adopting the uh, or I'm sorry, uh, sorry, an ordinance uh, adoption uh, resolution for summary publication of the rezoning. And um, if you are interested, there's a code, um, a motion to uh, for a city initiated code amendment as requested by Pawn America for that um, uh, code amendment. So and with that, I can take any questions you may have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So clarify for us once again, if you could, and, and I think it will help shape the discussion, the difference between the, the non-conforming use as opposed to a, um, um, I'm blanking on the other option for a, a conditional use. Basically, what, what, what are the options for um, the pawn shops? If, if, they, if they are not included in the B4 zoning discussion, mm -hmm. uh, the voting, zoning change, it'd still be... A non-conforming use, they could be there. They couldn't expand. Mm -hmm. They couldn't rebuild if there was a a need to rebuild for some reason. Uh, uh, Mayor, they, yeah. So um, you're right. They would be able to continue within the the current uh, shape of their operations right now um, mm -hmm. in perpetuity as long as uh, they didn't expand. Uh, their, you know, the footprint of, you know, because that would be considered an expansion of the use, and that would go against. Uh, uh, nonconformities that would violate nonconformities. So in which case they would need to be brought into compliance with the B4 z uh, zoning district and that wouldn't, uh, in its current status, wouldn't allow pawn shops. Um, but uh, I believe, um, I don't have the code language off the top of my head. I think there's something about uh, fire-related damage. Uh, and anyways, I probably shouldn't get into that if I can't <laughs> recount the code language exactly. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, so there is some manner in which they can continue um, with the rezoning um, as a legal nonconformity. But with uh, the code amendment that they're proposing, they, they could rebuild, they could expand, they could um, maybe relocate uh, the, uh, the, the structure on the, the property to be brought in compliance with B4. Um, and that would allow them to... Um, yeah, uh, to to expand if if they if they chose to with the proposed amendment, yeah, but and that, that's yeah. helpful. Thank you. Okay, they have either expressed uh, we have two and have either expressed thoughts or plans to expand, rebuild, do anything different than what they've been doing for the past. Uh, Mayor, I fifty years. Oh, oh uh, Mayor. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm not sure where the other one is located. I know that there is. There are, are laws and regulations about how many pawn shops can exist per uh, 50,000 uh, in population. So I think it's, there's obviously just two. And then the, the one under consideration along Lindale Avenue um, in our meeting, I mean, they're, they're here in attendance tonight. So I'm, I'm guessing that question could be better directed to them, but I, I can't recall them uh, talking about plans to expand, but uh, they can probably provide more light. That, that might be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Council, additional questions here? Councilmember Carter and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I had a question just along similar lines, so I appreciated the letter that was sent in from the um, owners 
And they talked a little bit about, you know, really wanting to be part of um, the revitalization of Lindale and listed some of the goals uh, in the letter. And I guess I was just curious if um, if they were planning on making some of these types of changes that are listed as part of some of the goals on the Lindale Avenue retrofit. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of thinking through, like, you know, as a legally nonconforming business, it doesn't seem like this change would do harm to them as it currently, like if we pass it as it is currently proposed today, unless they were to expand, which sounds like there still might be avenues to move forward. Um, but to me, it really feels like in their letter, they're, they're getting at that they want to be part of the revitalization efforts. And so I guess I'm just curious what that looks like for them, if they are willing to talk about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Carter, I'll, yeah, I'll probably leave, leave that to them to, to, exp, uh, to expand on that. But, um, yeah, they, that's something that was emphasized during our conversations. But I think they probably have a better idea of the specifics. And we'll, we'll invite them up. Let's exhaust questions here just in general, and then we'll invite uh, our, our guests up, and we'll have that discussion. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> um, I had one question for, um, for planning, and then I have a separate question, I think, that probably will go towards the owner, if that's okay. Um, uh, why did we not include pawn shops as a legal use in B2 to begin with? Uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro, um, Nick, do you have the history on that? Okay. Sorry, I'll have to. That's okay. Sure. That up to my... hey. oh, <laughs> it's going around. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, good to see you again this evening. So the B4 zoning district was created in 2006. Um, uh, as with the creation, similar to the process we went through with transitional industrial, uh, when you create a new zoning district, you're going to go through your use table and kind of do an analysis uh, in terms of what uses are consistent with the purpose and goals uh, of that underlying zoning district and add those uses accordingly, whether it be permitted or conditional uses, uh, accessory uses, etc. cetera. Uh, my understanding at the time when the B4 district was created uh, was that specifically with respect uh, to pawn shops, that was a little bit before some of the licensing requirements were updated uh, for uh, pawn shops, which now uh, frankly represents the largest uh, kind of impediment to the expansion or prolifer pro proliferation of that use. Uh, in Bloomington related to, as Tom said, uh, the maximum quantity uh, per the um, uh, ratio of residents. Um, and so prior to that time, um, uh, I think there was some analysis done just in terms of that wall on its face, pawn shops uh, as a use may not be totally inconsistent or out of step with the goals and intent of the B4. Uh, they strictly just wanted to limit uh, pawn shops to where they existed at that time, which was in the B2 zoning district. And so that's why in addition to not just B4, uh, we added other commercial zoning districts, the freeway districts, the C's, uh, and other uh, commercial zoning districts, they didn't add pawn shops to uh, any of those districts either. Um, so I don't think it had so much to do with the purpose and intent of B4 as, as in so much that they just did not want to increase um, uh, further expansion of that use. Okay, so is it, a, is it your opinion then that given we have those licensing requirements in place that it, it for lack of a better way to put it, does no harm to provide it as a conditional use? Is that essentially what you're saying? Uh, Mayor, Councilmember D'Alessandro, uh, I, I mean, I preface everything by that we want to do some analysis and research about sure. uh, pawn shops. Frankly, it's not a use that we have studied in any uh, close detail uh, since probably the licensing uh, updates that were done. Um, so with that caveat to it, uh, on its face, I don't, we don't think that it's inherently um, inconsistent with the retrofit or with B4, okay. uh, but saying that we do want to study it uh, some more, which, which this process would allow for. Sure. Um, the other comment, flipping that on its head a little bit here, is that this is a standalone building. Is there any reason not to just leave it as B2 and leave it alone so that we don't have to go through that process? You want me to take a stab at that yes. one? <laughs> so Mayor, Mayor Councilmember D'Alessandro, uh, you know, um, cities do all sorts of uh, <laughs> odd things to accommodate, you know, existing business owners, and rightfully so, they want to support their local business community and 
and do some of those things. But um, just from a, uh, from a planning perspective, it would make more sense to do an evaluation of uh, pawn shops in the B4 use than it would be to have a spot zone of B2, just from a regulatory complexity standpoint. But they have different intensity uh, standards. B4 does call for higher uh, minimum floor area ratios and some different performance standards. So as properties develop over time, if you have one uh, parcel that's surrounded by other uh, regulatory requirements, uh, the built environment is not going to be able to uh, be uniform and eventually would not be in furtherance of the retrofits uh, vision or guiding principles with respect to the performance standards that B2 allows for. Uh, and some of those things are the, the parking and the buildings not up at the street and uh, some of the less intensity that the B2 allows for. So just a perspective about that. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Council, additional questions? Council Member Kerner, another one? Thank you, Mayor. So if we were to direct staff to bring forward um, a city-initiated city code amendment to change the status of pawn shops to the B in the B4 district, um, and you said that there would be, we, you would need to study it, is that going to be intensive, time-consuming? Like we have a lot of, I, we come up with all kinds of ideas all the time to, you know, throw toward the planning staff. And so I guess I'm just curious if this is, um, going to cause a conversation to reprioritize other issues that we already have prioritized or if, is it a pretty minimal ask of planning staff to study this piece around the pawn shops and before certainly uh mayor council member carter i i um it's, uh, we've met and we've discussed it um it will require just some study but we also want the public hearing process to play out too so we're also trying to accommodate that and want to be respectful for people who provide public testimony in opposition or support of, um, you know, the proposed amendment. So, uh, you know, the, the study component would, I, I don't believe it would be too intense. It's just a matter of, uh, e examining what, uh, standards we currently have, uh, imposed upon, uh, pawn shops within the city. How does that, um, how does that uh, conflict or uh, further the goals of the, the retrofit plan within that context? But it will also allow, I guess, pawn shops to, or sorry, it'll allow pawn shops to exist in other areas of the city where there's before. Um, here's here's a map right now of all the uh, areas that are uh, the concentrated areas of uh, before parcels. So wherever, um, uh, before exists, that's where a pawn shop could could go. So, but there still could only be two pawn shops in Bloomington. Uh, correct. Right, because it's one per fifty thousand mm -hmm. residents. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, if if I can just add to that, I concur with uh, Tom's assessment. I think it's more of a discrete uh, study. It wouldn't um, uh, result in a reprioritization of any of our other projects that are currently ongoing. Yep. Council Member Loman. Is that that law that that uh, uh, fifty you know fifty thousand you know people per pawn shop? Is that a state law or uh, Mayor uh, Councilmember uh, Loman? Not to my knowledge, it's a uh, it is a local uh, licensing provision. It might be a model that other cities follow uh, in terms of that use. I'm not uh, highly knowledgeable about it. Probably our city clerk and licensing staff are probably the most knowledgeable about that. Um, but it's my understanding that it's a it's a fraction thereof. So I believe if Bloomington were to grow above 100,000, there would be some ability to um, increase a license at that point. At that point, um, they'd be able yep. to put another one somewhere else uh, right. in the city. Or if we were to change those. And <clears throat> those are all, yeah, yes, Mayor and Councilmember Loman, the, the licensing provisions are within the city code and certainly under your authority and purview uh, to change those as uh, you deem appropriate. So. Also, anything else? I, I do. Our planning staff? Mayor, if I may yes. make one just quick uh, uh, discrete clarification. So there was a discussion about, um, you know, whether pawn shops could be located in other B4 sites. Some of that will be tied with whatever decision the policymakers make in terms of whether you follow the, the discrete recommend or request of Pawn America to, uh, to allow this use as a conditional use, but only in existence prior to that adoption date of the rezoning versus just as a flat uh, conditional use um, within the B4 zoning district, setting kind of the licensing and the number of them issue aside, 
Um, if the use was not in existence anywhere else and before prior to that date, then um, it's likely that that would not allow any other additional pawn shops in before regardless. So just to keep an eye on that issue as well. All right, thank you. Uh, we have some specific questions for our, our friends here. If, if you want to come forward, if you could, please. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. If you could Thanks identify for yourself me. for the record, please. Yeah, I'm Brett Switzenberg. Um, on behalf of Pond America and uh, the property owner as well, who's an affiliated business entity. Thanks for being here with us tonight, Mr. Switzenberg. Hey, thanks for having me. Councilmember Carter, you had specific questions on the uh, on the possible reuse? Um, so I, uh, I was just reading or skimming through your letter again, and um, you had referenced the Lindell Avenue retrofit and that uh, Pond America wants to be, you know, more involved in taking steps to, well, I guess I don't know what those steps are. That's what I'm curious about. Um, you listed some of the goals of the retrofit study in the letter, and so um, – just as you're thinking about wanting this change made so that you can do those things, I was just curious if you had a sense right now of you know, what those changes might be or if it's just discussions that you all want to have in the future and be able to, to do. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's more the latter. So there's no you know, direct plans to redevelop the property at this point. But you know, um, given the, the goals are to make the corridor more navigable and to increase development there, whether it's, you know, Multifamily with you know storefronts on the first floor or something like that. Everything moved closer to Lindale Avenue with the the setbacks being changed. Uh, we want the ability to you know support that redevelopment. Um, and so you know specifically with you know, it's section twenty one point five zero four of the zoning code defines an expansion of a nonconformity as relocation of the use to a structure structure or portion of the site not previously occupied by the use. So. You know, one of the goals is to move parking lots to the to the backs of the property, you know, off of Lindale Avenue and to, you know, move, change that setback so the buildings can be closer to the to the to the corridor. Um, we wouldn't be able to do that. And the city council wouldn't be able to approve us to do that, given the current zoning code. And so as a conditional use, it doesn't change, you know, our ability to unilaterally you know, redevelop the property. It, it keeps that with with uh, city council and. Uh, but it gives you all the ability to approve that should, you know, a developer come in and want to redevelop the corridor. And, um, yeah, we just want to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, <clears throat> uh, do you, um, the, the, the property owners, um, are they involved in the business? You said that they're kind of as a, 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 se a separate interest, or is it? Is it? Uh, does Pond America own the building? I guess is my question. Is it? Is it an owner-occupied building at this time? Definitely. Just a procedural. Sorry, Mayor, Council Members, That's Council okay. Member D'Alessandro. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, the, the answer to that is yeah, Pond America is essentially tied to the to the property owner. They're one and the same, just not the same. Understood. But uh, yes, yeah, we effectively own the property as well. Okay. Um, have you have you had any um, have you had any interest in expanding your business um, prior to like that has come before council in in the past twenty five years? I think you've been around twenty five years. You said right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that dates me. <laughs> not dates me a bit, but I'm <laughs> not you personally. Be, I meant the business. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, in in the past uh, twenty five years, I'm not sure if there's been any expansion. Um, currently, there's no plan to expand. Ex expand the floor the floor plan of the building and there, there wouldn't be there's no talks of that we wouldn't want to do that it's just purely you know if there was a casualty that knocked down the building or we wanted to redevelop like we'd be able to maybe um seek council's uh opinion and, and blessing and you know maybe moving the building to uh, to so that it's in compliance with the b4 district and uh um you know based on the current zoning code we wouldn't be able to do that so it's i I appreciate that. So, so to, to sum up, if I can, your request is is um, tied more so to the definition of expansion as noted in the statute, as opposed to your interest personally in expanding your business. Is that a fair characterization of what you said? That is fair. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. All right. Well, thank you. I think we'll move on to the public hearing now. And if we have additional questions or comments afterward during our discussion, we'll, we'll 
we will call on you again. But Perfect. You Appreciate being. your time. I do want to say I'm appreciative and, and impressed by the conversations we've been able to have with your city staff, uh, particularly um, planner Rem Wilson and, and uh, city planning manager Mark Regard. So thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. So, Council, thanks for that discussion. But with that, I will open the public hearing item 4.8. This is a public hearing regarding the Lindale Avenue properties rezoning from B2 to B4. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to item 4.8 tonight? Mr. Brillard, anyone on the phone? Uh, Mr. Mayor, there's one name I don't recognize. We're going to check in with a Ray Hayhurst. Uh, Mr. Hayhurst, you are unmuted if you were looking to speak on this item uh, 4.8. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Last call for anybody here in the chambers. Council, we've got no one in the chambers coming forward and a mistake on the phone. So we're, uh, we have no one coming forward to speak at uh, this evening's public hearing on item 4.8. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4. So moved. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.8. No further public discussion on this. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Public hearing is closed. Councilor, your thoughts on this? Um, and break it in. Let's break this into two different chunks. First of all, the, the rezoning in general, what we think about the rezoning as proposed by staff, and then whether or not we want to direct staff to bring forward the city-initiated code amendment as requested by Pawn America. But let's start with the the rezoning in general. Are there are there questions, are there concerns, comments regarding the rezoning proposed as it is? No, I think uh, we we had the, a good discussion, I think, during the the uh, study session on this, and I think we got some good feedback uh, back and forth from between council and staff on this. So hearing no council discussion on this, council, I'd look for, uh, for action. Uh, I'd look for a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the city zoning map by rezoning property shown in Exhibit A from B2 General Commercial to B4 Neighborhood Commercial. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter to adopt that ordinance amending the city zoning map by rezoning property shown in Exhibit A from B2 General Commercial to B4 Neighborhood Commercial. No further so council. Uh, Councilmember Lua, question? Nope. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Uh, Councilmember, who made the motion? I'm sorry, was it? I, I will make the motion. Councilmember <clears throat> council Mua, summary publication. Uh, I would move to uh, adopt a resolution <clears throat> authorizing summary publication of ordinance. Um, an ordinance amending the city's zoning map by rezoning properties shown on Exhibit A from B2 General Commercial to B4 Neighborhood Commercial. Second. Motion by Councilmember Mua, second by Councilmember Lohman for summary publication. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries 6-0. Now, Council, question uh, regarding the possible city-initiated code amendment as requested by Pawn America. Thoughts on that? Uh, do we want to move forward with this, or do we want to... Uh, uh, what do we want to do? Councilmember Lohman, question? I can't see any reason why we shouldn't move forward with it. I mean, I think they've laid out a pretty good case. Uh, um, you know, I mean, you'd probably have to make a move somewhere else in the city. They want to be a part of it. Why not? Well, let's let's do it. Councilmember Martin? Uh, thank you. Just noting in the packet here, I know obviously we're not bound by historical conversations about kind of uh, pawn shops in the community, but it sounds like there was – um, some purposeful decisions reached in terms of numbers licensing by population. So with with that in mind, I also think about a lot of the community engagement that we did in the Lindale Avenue retrofit um, exercise. And while obviously pawn shops are an econo economic driver in the community, um, I don't know that that was ne necessarily the intention um, that I heard from residents about saying that these were features that they wanted in the zoning districts that were going to be included along Blindale Avenue. Um, so uh, again, in this particular case, obviously uh, business activity and a valued member of the community, but over the long term, um, when I look at the, the vision of what I heard from residents to be included in these zones and the purpose of the changes, 
it was over time to modify the makeup of that part of our community mm -hmm. and move it in a direction um, that, that was substantially different than what we have there today. So I guess I, I would be hesitant to move forward with this, but it's my two cents. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> to your point, uh, Councilmember Martin, I feel like I feel like what one of the things that Nick said when he was up at the dais was we could we could do this in a way that limits limits it to this property because it's that, forgive me I'm going to ask you to come forward and help me understand this again, Mr. Johnson. I think that what what you were saying was. There's some like, timing associated with this, right? Yeah, Mayor, member, uh, member Delisandro. So, uh, if you if the within the Pan America letter, what they're specifically requesting the city uh, to consider uh, is to allow pawn shops in operation as of September nineteenth, twenty twenty three, and that date is very intentional and specific, in so much as that that is the day after the initiation of uh, the rezoning. Um, uh, uh, would you know take effect upon publication of the paper, but basically the day after the city council action. So um, by limiting it in that way, uh, even if you allowed um, uh, pawn shops and uh, before in this way, and your and your population increased, um, uh, suggesting or um, uh, considering you know the the licensing the existing licensing requirements, um, additional pawn shops could not proliferate or expand or uh, operate in before uh, with this narrow uh, allowance that they're suggesting. Right, and so I don't know if that addresses your concern, but it would be more of a long term way of preventing additional pawn shops from going into B four district, uh, and then at the same time. I'm enabling the folks at Pond America to continue business in their current location. I don't know if that's a good compromise to consider, but I wanted to throw that out there. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And, and I appreciate that, Councilmember D'Alessandro. I, I think just overall, um, I mean, obviously going from the 10,000 foot down to specific examples, it, it gets yeah. a, a little tougher. But just knowing that, at least to what I understood the purpose of the Lindale Avenue retrofit, is looking at the use mix that exists along that corridor and hearing folks say really high auto intensity uses like drive throughs or auto parts stores or medium industrial or pawn shops, um, folks were looking for a generation from now a substantially different vision than what currently exists there. Um, and on these individual use basis, again, it's, it's, it's awkward, but I think as changes continue to move forward um, just not continuing to make carve outs for the existing businesses that are there, um, knowing that if if that's ends up being the rule, nothing's ever going to change. So, but I appreciate yeah, gotcha. that. Yeah. Okay. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. And I would agree with Councilmember Martin here. Um, I think, <clears throat> by and large, the way that the ordinance is proposed now to 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 switch would allow the 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 business to continue. Um, but it's the 30, 40, 50, 60 years down the road. Is that the same vision um, and is that the same makeup that we want to continue? And that as a resident <clears throat> for, before being on council was my understanding of it. Um, in 60 years when my kids are growing up, is Lindale going to look the same as it does now? And that, that was not the intention. And so, um, well, I, I appreciate that we have that and we can continue supporting this business um, as a non-conforming. I think that's the vision that I would like to see is what's Lindale going to be in 50 years, not necessarily keeping it, allowing it to stay the same. So I, Council Member D'Alessandro. Something that just came to me, if you will, Mr. Mayor, and I, and I don't know if I don't want to put it either Council Member Martin or Council Member Mua on the spot, but the the thought process that um, that I'm I'm interpreting myself is that it's about the type of business and not about the type of land use. And in zoning, we're talking about land use. We're not necessarily talking about type of business. And so I think um, from my perspective, giving them the opportunity to conform with the land use requirements we're looking for, setback, windows, other things like that, feels like it, as opposed to forcing them out of that area, um, we, we um, saying in another way, if they're willing to make redevelopment on the building happen, let's say in five years from now, 
And the alternative is to wait for 30 years until they decide to jettison that business. Did we do what we wanted to do from a land use perspective? And that's that's the, the consideration I would make in that regard. Because <clears throat> if 30 years from now that that business decides it doesn't want to be there, what you're going to get in the meantime if you give them the conditional use is a building that's conforming to the land use requirements of the zone if they do their their you know that they they are part of the retrofit. If you don't, what you're going to get 30 years from now is a building that's non-conforming, and an, and and empty. And now it's not attractive to the people that want to move in there because it didn't get updated to look and feel like the rest of the land use. So that would be the reason I would consider um, supporting this, because you might get out of it the land use requirement you're looking for, and regardless of what business is in there, you're going to get you're going to get that. Um, that aesthetic, which was what we're trying to go for. that Throw that out there for consideration. Thanks. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so if we were to move forward tonight, this is just to, again, study it, and then staff would come back, and there would be a public hearing, and we would have more discussion, and then we would actually be, like, we would actually vote on it then. This is just to allow s staff to move forward with researching and bringing forth a formal proposal. Yeah. Mayor, that's correct. Correct. That is correct, yes. Um, because that's the case, I'm, I'll support moving forward tonight. Uh, I, I Thank you, Councilmember Carter, and I was just going to move it along in that way as well. I think I would uh, agree with, with both sides here. I would agree to move it along so we can continue this further, continue the discussion further. I think it will be good to have a full council as we do it and you know, make sure Councilmember Nelson is involved. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm quite in line with Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Mua. Uh, zoning is about land use and the land use is what's happening on that land. And so if it is a, if it is something that we don't see as compatible or desirable in terms of what we want uh, Lindale Avenue to be in 40 years, then I think this is a, is a certainly a germane conversation to be having. That being said, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with the, the notion of moving this study forward and then having this discussion at a later date. Um, and, and we can evaluate different, you know, more, more completely with a more complete council evaluate the options on this and see where we want to be. I think that makes sense. So, Councilmember Carter, do you want to uh, make the motion to direct staff to bring forward a city initiated code uh, amendment to change the status of pawn shops in the district, pawn shops in the B4 district? Yes, I will move that motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to direct staff to bring forward a city initiated co city code amendment to change the status of pawn shops in the B4 district and um, direct staff to do so. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. So if you bring forward information for us and we will have this conversation in, in more in depth in the future. <coughs> so, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, sorry, Mayor, uh, one, uh, pardon the interruption. Um, this wasn't formalized in the, the staff report, but we were hoping to get some guidance on exploring additional rezonings along Lindale Avenue. If there's an appetite for that, um, staff believes there are opportunities, but we needed we we uh, we would like guidance from you if you if you have any. Uh, my my response would be yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think if we if we consider if we have a good thing going here and we have we see changes happening, I think it makes good sense to con consider additional zoning changes. Again. Consider, not adopt tonight, but consider and talk about in the future. Councilmember D'Alessandro? I have a very specific question because it's been asked of me like four times in the past two weeks, and I just want to try to clear the air if possible, and it's related to this. Um, specifically, when we say there have been potentially opportunities, are we talking about David Fong's? Because I'd really just like everybody to know if that's true. Has that, has that come up? Because I'm, I'm being, I have heard all kinds of things about that particular property, but if there actually is somebody interested in developing that and we need to change the zone to accommodate that, why, we should probably just be transparent about that. That's what I'm getting to. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, Mayor Councilmember D'Alessandro. So we have received questions about the uh, David Fong site, and some of the questions uh, would involve development that's consistent with uh, B4, and some of those questions would involve development that's not consistent with uh, B4. Uh, as a zoning district. And so one of the questions were uh, that's stimulating our internal discussion uh, is with some of the changes that have happened around the 94, 94th Street node since the adoption of the Lindale retrofit uh, is would the consultant team who, cra you know, in consultation with the city, would they have uh, omitted 94th Street uh, had those things occurred 
um, uh, prior, you know, at the culmination of their process. We don't believe they would have. Um, but, you know, that's something that we, we're not suggesting that it is a done deal, that it's something that should go forward concrete. It's something that we should study uh, because the time appears to be somewhat of the essence. And uh, uh, frankly, um, just with the guidance of the Lindale retrofit, we just need more regulatory tools in order to continue furtherance of that plan um, if we're going to execute it to the full vision. So That's very helpful. In, in no way is the city of Bloomington trying to buy that property, though, correct? Uh, Mayor, Councilor Del Sandro, that sounds, uh, I don't work in the Port Authority. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, not to my knowledge, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I'm not making it up. They're the amazing things that come out of, of people, you know, when they're because they get wind of something and it gets construed and they play telephone. And next thing you know, it's not anything like what we anybody said. So I just I'm, wanted to be clear. Thank you. I'm, I'm never amazed by that, to be honest. So, so but no, I, I have not heard any any discussion on that. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you to our planning staff for your work on this one. Our. Final item on number four uh, is 4.9. This is a discussion of our neighborhood traffic management plan with a public comment opportunity. Ms. Long, good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, tonight I'm pleased to present Ray Hayhurst from Kimley Horn and Associates to give our presentation in conjunction with our city traffic engineer, um, Kirk Roberts. It's been a change of what's in your agenda, so. We are flexible, if nothing else. Sure. Sure. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, again, Ray Hayhurst uh, with Kim Lee Horn. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Uh, our agenda for tonight uh, is as follows. Uh, we'll provide a overview of the project, uh, its purpose, and our goals, as well as provide a summary of the feedback that we've heard uh, thus far from the public. Uh, we'll present our recommendations for speed limits on local streets, as well as our recommendations for changes to the traffic calming request program. Uh, and at the conclusion, we'll uh, provide several uh, recommended motion options for your consideration. Uh, as a overview, uh, the city is updating its neighborhood traffic management program for local streets. Uh, this program will build on existing neighborhood traffic programs and add new programs that reflect the city's commitment to safety and livability of its neighborhoods. Uh, it's important to note uh, that we want to make the program easier for residents to navigate uh, the various programs and uh, take advantage of the services provided by the city. Specifically, uh, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program uh, strengthens and integrates uh, the city's existing programs. Uh, last December, uh, the City Council directed staff to uh, look at updating the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program uh, uh, to specifically include five elements. That's speed limits on local streets, the traffic calming request program, pavement management program, speed awareness program, and the neighborhood uh, park access. And the, the intent is to create a comprehensive approach to manage traffic speeds, improve safety, and increase access for people walking, biking, and taking transit. So the overall goals of the program uh, are listed are shown on the screen. Uh, they include safety, mobility, accessibility, equity uh, in this context, uh, making sure that all communities experience better health and well-being uh, with a particular focus on disadvantaged populations and populations that traditionally uh, don't access uh, certain city, uh, city services and programs. And lastly, uh, the goals of efficacy and fiscal sustainability, as well as making the program clear and easy to understand uh, so more members of the community are aware of the program and its benefits. We kicked this project off in February. Uh, we had uh, two phases of engagement. Uh, the first phase, uh, we introduced the project and listened to the community's concerns uh, regarding traffic safety, uh, 
later on in the spring, uh, we provided updates to Planning Commission uh, in this body of City Council, um, and we incorporated uh, the feedback that we heard into a set of draft recommendations, uh, and we had another round of public engagement. Over the summer, we've refined our recommendations, and we're here today uh, to present the final recommendations uh, that are included in our report. As I mentioned, uh, there were two rounds of engagement. Uh, we had uh, two virtual open houses, several uh, pop-up events. Uh, we reached almost 200 people in person. Uh, and in addition, on our interactive map and online surveys uh, hosted on the Let's Talk Bloomington website, uh, we reached uh, almost uh, 300 uh, responses uh, between the two, uh, between the map and the surveys. And lastly, uh, there have been announcements uh, and coverage in the Star Tribune and Bloomington Briefing. Uh, this slide shows uh, the survey responses. Um, notably, in our first round of engagement, we had a more uh, diverse demographics of, of survey respondents um, as compared to our, our second uh, round of survey respondents. Uh, admittedly, it was a challenge uh, to, um, despite efforts to uh, reach a, a greater cross segment of the uh, community. But what we did hear uh, at, from uh, the second survey uh, was that people who responded were interested in using a new uh, neighborhood traffic calming process to report their traffic safety concerns. Uh, when asked about the new recommended lower speed limit, uh, over two-thirds of respondents uh, said they strongly supported or somewhat supported uh, the recommendation. And lastly, uh, when asked uh, what should be done to improve traffic safety uh, near schools, near neighborhood schools, um, enforcing speed limits, lowering speed limits, and installing traffic calming treatments were the top three uh, uh, considerations. Broadly speaking, um, we heard Four, four main themes. Uh, I think the first is the limited awareness of the existing traffic calming program and its benefits. Secondly, uh, we heard from the public, planning commission, and the city council the importance of safety near schools, not only the safety of, of our children in the community, but also safety, broadly speaking, of vulnerable road users. Uh, we heard specific safety and cut-through traffic concerns in the neighborhoods, as well as on no, non-local streets, non streets uh, which is not uh, necessarily the purview of this specific program. And last we, lastly, we heard uh, excitement from the community uh, about uh, using new, new tool, new process to easily request traffic calming. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we were before, we provided updates to the Planning Commission and City Council in the spring. Uh, we received uh, great feedback. Uh, you know, broadly speaking, there seemed to be gen uh, support for lower speed limits on local streets, especially near schools, um, and general support for changes to the traffic calming request program. Uh, but staff uh, was uh, asked to uh, bring bring back uh, additional data on implementation costs, as well as funding sources. Last week, uh, we presented to the Planning Commission, uh, and they did not accept, uh, they did not recommend acceptance of the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program um, by a four to two vote. Uh, while there was general support of school zone speed limits and a more accessible traffic calming request program. Uh, there was no consensus on uh, lower speed limits uh, for local streets, and there were concerns about the cost of speed limit implementation, as well as retaining a special tax assessment for funding traffic calming. Oh. 
Um, so based on the sorry, the feedback uh, that we re uh, heard from the community, planning commission, and city council uh, in late spring, uh, as well as a review of uh, existing conditions and best practices. Uh, we're recommending a 25 mile per hour speed limit for all local streets uh, with consideration of a lower speed limit uh, in school zones. Uh, notably, uh, I just want to emphasize that this recommendation is for local streets only and does not include non-local streets that are currently posted at 30 miles per hour. So that includes um, 104th Street, 106th Street, and uh, 110th Street, just to name uh, a couple. <laughs> uh, and uh, just for, for reference, uh, this slide shows a map of uh, existing speed limits uh, as they are today. Uh, we were asked uh, by the Planning Commission and City Council to provide uh, more information on speed limits in surrounding communities. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, effective August 2019, all cities in Minnesota can uh, set speed limits on local streets. Uh, locally, uh, several cities such as Edina and St. Louis Park have implemented lower speed limits on their local streets. Uh, Richfield is currently in the process of studying their speed limits. Uh, and you may be aware that the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul have set a 20 mile per hour speed limit on most of their local streets. Uh, we will point out that in both Minneapolis and St. Paul, generally speaking, their local streets have a narrower uh, right of way and more parking demand. So it naturally f feels for drivers a, a place where you would travel uh, hopefully closer to 20 miles per hour. Um, so going back to Adina and St. Louis Park, um, we want to note that speed limits vary in both cities um, and is uh, more dependent on the context and can, can change uh, uh, based on a number of, of factors. So it's not a across the board uh, speed limit, um, which has from our spec perspective and, and the reach research um, has uh, some uh, pros and cons, you know, well, namely, you just got the lack of consistency may be uh, an issue for, for drivers. Um, the major takeaway on this slide is that there has been no comprehensive uh, post-implementation evaluation locally. Uh, many of the evaluations nationwide have been for uh, larger cities, such as city of Boston and city of Seattle. So our goals for uh, setting speed limits uh, are, are the following. First, we want to promote uh, safer speeds. So we want to set speed limits lower, uh, particularly uh, in areas uh, where the, near schools, as well as areas with uh, vulnerable road users. Uh, as this graphic shows uh, and kind of emphasizes why we care about speed, uh, the risk to pedestrian um, greatly increases as driver speed uh, increases. Secondly, and this gets back to my point earlier, uh, we want to maintain consistency um, for drivers and to encourage voluntary compliance with uh, the speed limit. And lastly, we want to set reasonable expectations. Um, Based on the data that we've that city staff has collected on local streets, most drivers are actually traveling closer to 25 miles per hour or lower on local streets where it's currently posted 30 miles per hour. So we we feel it's important to set reasonable expectations um, and, and again to encourage voluntary compliance. And lastly, um, we want to set speed limits to support. Uh, the road hierarchy and other components of the program, uh, which Kirk uh, will touch on shortly. Yep. Council members, Kirk Roberts, traffic and transportation engineer. Um, 
so I wanted to provide some additional details and support for the speed limit that's being recommended on our local streets. Tonight's discussion focused on local streets, including those speed limits. We're presenting it that way because the council asked that we establish a comprehensive set of changes uh, to manage speeds on local streets, including speed limits. In the next few months, staff are going to be advancing recommendations for speed limit changes on the larger non-county roadways in the city, and that's the map you see in front of you. Um, However, the two things are, are related a little bit. Um, and if it's thought, if the council wishes to make a decision on both the local street speed limits and these larger streets, uh, we could bring both of these forward in the near future, if that makes more sense to you. But tonight we're bringing this forward uh, for the local streets. Um, as to, go ahead one more, as to how they're related, this slide um, uh, is just sort of a road hierarchy. Um, with a 25 mile an hour speed limit on local streets, the proposal that would move forward, um, the larger start streets starting with collectors be posted at 30 miles an hour. Um, there's a couple arterials that would be posted at 35, that's namely American Boulevard and some portions of 98th Street. The um, trouble, and, and this is a nice hierarchy, the, the reason behind it, go one more slide forward, under the current hierarchy, um, is 30 miles an hour is the speed limit on local streets as well of most as well as most of our collector streets. So this includes roads like 102nd Street, 106th Street, as Ray mentioned, Xerxes Avenue, um, and the problem here is that drivers tend to optimize for time and would much rather have them keep the bulk of their trips on that collector arterial system yet we have a speed limit that's the same on our local streets, providing no time advantage to using the collectors and arterials. The best thing we can do for our neighborhoods to keep traffic calm is keep people on the collectors and arterials for their trips. And we'd like to set speed limits that, that dovetail with that. The, under the current configuration, the only way that we could have affected such a change is perhaps to raise the speed limits on collector streets, and I'm not advocating for that, but you see the kind of the dilemma that we've been in historically here. Um, so setting consistent but lower speeds on local streets encourages traffic to use the collector and arterial system and stay out of the neighborhoods. Um, and next, several... Uh, on the 25 mile an hour recommendation, several council members have been contacted about traffic issues on Bessie Road, and, and you're frequently, we're all contacted about traffic issues on various streets. This is just the one that we heard about most recently, and so I'm going to use it for illustrative purposes. It's not to call anyone out, and I'm grateful for the neighborhood reaching out and the neighbors talking about the traffic issues they're facing, so I just want to make sure neighbors understand that I do appreciate and respect their, their positions. Um, so next up here, this we last year in response to some complaints, complaints from the neighbors, we actually gathered data on Bessie um, for a couple of days, gathered speed and volume data, and I plotted it out here. And this is what it looks like. This is a scatter plot of people driving on Bessie Road with this, the 30 mile an hour speed limit overlaid on top. There's a couple things that are notable. First off, most of the traffic is already at or below 30 miles an hour. The reason that's interesting is if you talk to most drivers in the city, and it's not just Bloomington, it's not just people you know, but they don't know that the local street speed limits are 30 miles an hour. Um, if you don't believe me, ask your spouse and see what they come up with. Ask them what the, the speed limit is um, outside. If they've recently taken their driver's test, they might know, but the rest of uh, Minnesota doesn't. Um, but yet, these are people that have lived in this neighborhood. They have an interest in the neighborhood. They have relationships. They have this sense of self-protection from them and their neighbors, and they've come to this equilibrium speed that's pretty good in those circumstances. They've found a way to operate consistently, except for the upper right. This person's in every neighborhood. Um, every neighborhood seems to have one or two of these. Um, this is a person that's driving very fast. When we get emails from neighbors concerned about speed, this is the person they're writing about. The majority of people in our neighborhoods are driving appropriately, given the circumstances, given the rules. Um, and 
this person is quite a challenge for engineers and for council members um, because traffic calming, traffic management is geared towards changing a behavior of all the drivers, of everyone on the roadway instead of one specific individual. Uh, so we don't have a lot of tools at our disposal uh, to deal with this person. And I don't think we'd be up, honestly, in the middle of the night when he's he or she is bombing around the neighborhoods anyway because we're in the council chambers. <laughs> So the, the biggest takeaway from this slide, though, is when I go into a neighborhood like this and I'm trying to respond to neighbors' concerns, there aren't a lot of problems in this neighborhood that merit city expenditures, public dollars being spent to solve a problem. Most people are, at the, are below the speed limit. They're operating according to the rules. There's not a lot that I can do for this area right now. So advance to the next one, if you would. So this is what that neighborhood looks like at 25 miles an hour. This is the same data. We just put the 25 mile an hour speed limit. What good does this change do? So right now we've got about one third of the neighborhood above the limit and two thirds below that line. You still got the knucklehead in the middle of the night is doing what they're doing. But um, the, the good thing about this as a speed limit is that it affirms what a majority of the drivers are doing anyway. That's a really good place to be on public policy when you can say to people, the way that you're responding here, the way that you're managing this is what we would like. That's about the behavior we'd like. And the um, other third we can reach. So advance one more. This is a group. Um, the, the group that's above the speed limit line now, we can, um, the first thing we can do is loudly and proudly proclaim that the speed limit on local streets in Bloomington is 25 miles an hour and make that known. We've got the entryway signs and we'll have the other things that, um, that'll be talked about as Ray proceeds through his presentation. Um, again, these are people that are invested in this neighborhood. They have relationships. They have a sense of community. Um, they like their neighborhood, and they'll respond to that. If we set an expectation that this is how we think you should behave, we will see speed reductions in that, in that top portion. Uh, closer compliance at 25 is more attainable. Um, and that's also why it's probably the most common speed limit in the U.S. is 25 miles an hour on local streets. So, council, when we, uh, the same street, go back one more. Go back, yep. Yeah. If we came back in a year after changing the speed limits, two years, three years, we'd see speeds come down on some streets. If we don't see a significant change, we might need to do a little bit more. We can do some of those lower cost treatments like information. Maybe we put a radar sign out or the police deploy their speed radar trailer for a while just to inform drivers, hey, you're going a little faster than you should be on this roadway. They probably don't know. Perhaps we just have a lot of busy parents and they're just not aware of their speeds in that area. So we can continue to bring that down to what the community's expectation is for on that street. Um, if we had some specific problem areas, then we can address those perhaps with some uh, roadway changes through the traffic calming program, or we wait until we're doing some reconstruction work in there, and then we go and make those changes to address safety issues that are still remaining once we brought those speeds down to where we want them. So... The, the question comes up, and it has on Vessi, is why not go ahead and set the speed limit at 20 miles an hour? If we get some bang for the buck for 25, let's go to 20. And that's tempting. The, the next graph provides some clues. So if you move the speed limit to 20 with our existing data set, you've taken two-thirds of the drivers with that change, and you've made them violators. The road, the, the clues being sent by the roads in Bloomington seem to suggest that drivers feel safe, they feel comfortable at about 25 miles an hour or below. We've arbitrarily set this speed limit lower. Um, again, these are people that have lived there for long periods of time. They believe they're safe, good, moral, conscious people, and we've told them that how you're operating is incorrect. A wide majority of them, how they're operating is no longer correct. That's not just going to irritate them but it's going to seem like it was a decision that was made arbitrarily and it will lose credibility because the road, the community, the neighborhood they're in is not sending the signals that this is the right speed to go. Um, based on our density, the land use, the way that we've developed our road system, it just wouldn't make sense. Um, any 
changes in behavior would be short-lived, um, and you'd have a constant struggle to be trying to manage and, and inform people about their speeds. If we did want to change the road geometry, we'd have to go in and physically do construction, install speed humps or other traffic calming techniques along this roadway on a fairly consistent basis. Once we got through with this half mile stretch, we've got the rest of the 350 miles of city roadway to tackle at that point. Um, several cities, I want to um, just say several cities, um, as was alluded to, have gone down to a 20 mile an hour speed limit and they've been successful. These are cities like Seattle, Boston, and if you've been to those cities, the parking demand is very high. Often on a local street, you're down to one lane of traffic and you're having to negotiate. You're pretty fortunate if you get up to 20 miles an hour in those cities. That's been very successful to them. They're affirming what people already know and they've had good success. Um, Minneapolis and St. Paul have done similar. Again, cities with a much higher parking demand, a much different time when they were developed in the process, and those speed limits could make very good sense for those cities. The studies are out there. Uh, we'll see how they look when they do some follow-up work. But the way that Bloomington has built out, the way our land use um, has shaped up is a very different set of circumstances. And so the speed limit on local streets that hold the best opportunity to slow traffic and to improve quality of life for residents in Bloomington is 25 miles an hour, and that's what staff are recommending. And so, Council, if there aren't any questions on this specific portion, I'll turn it back over to Ray to finish this out. Questions, Council Member Lohman? Just a quick one, because um, uh, there was the, the argument made at, at the 20 the, on that earlier slide that went from 26% down to 13%. And that was the main argument on the on the on the Vesey piece, that you end up having that ten percent um, uh, reduction in in, in the uh, in chances of folks getting hurt. So, am I hearing you saying correctly that with the way that our roads are constructed, we really wouldn't find that same um, benefit to going down to twenty percent? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman. So this risk is independent of the specific streets. It's just to say that as speed increases, the risk to pedestrian does not increase linearly. It actually increases um, somewhat algebraically. And so there's always a higher risk to pedestrians when speeds are higher. And so I don't take any issue with that particular graph. Um, my argument is merely that Bloomington streets are much more amenable. They will be much more self-enforcing at 20 miles an hour, or 25 miles an hour posted than you would ever get at 20 miles an hour. And in fact, going to a 20 mile an hour speed limit uh, would be a, I, I would have very little long-term effect on driver speeds, I think, in Bloomington. Mayor, council members, uh, I'll proceed forward. Um, so touching on the, the second part of our recommendation, uh, which is consideration for school zone speed limits. Uh, so this would include uh, posted 20 mile per hour speed limits on select larger streets around public and private char charter schools uh, during arrival and dismissal periods. Uh, this recommendation would be uh, coincide with updating the city's uh, Safe Routes to School district-wide plan, and so supporting those lower speed limits in school zones with uh, recommendations for improving uh, pedestrian and bikes by school mobility. Um, notably, uh, a lot of schools in the city are located on non-local streets, uh, so we recommend coordination with, with the county on uh, setting the, those speed limits on their roadways. So our implementation plan for uh, lowering speed limits on local streets uh, has four main components, and I'll walk through them. Uh, the first component uh, includes policy, code, and process changes. So in addition to adopting a policy of 25 mile per hour speed limits on local streets, uh, with uh, consideration of a uh, lower school zone speed limit. Uh, there would be uh, changes to the code, uh, which include a ordinance that ex 
explicitly states the city's authority uh, without uh, including specific speed limits. Um, the second part of that, uh, or second thing to note, uh, is that there are no code changes needed for setting school zone speed limits. Uh, any changes to speed limits on larger non-county roadways uh, would be set by the city engineer and updated by official map. Uh, we've also identified the need for a signage plan for local streets, so that would include uh, 25 mile per hour speed limit signage, school zone flasher assembly, and uh, s speed radar signage. Um, We've also identified the need for a traffic signal plan uh, for non-local streets uh, where there is a, a lower school zone speed limit. Uh, and this would require coordination with the county, MnDOT, and neighboring municipalities. The second component of our implementation plan is uh, educating the public uh, about the new speed limits, uh, as Kirk mentioned. Uh, we recognize that uh, compliance, 100% compliance with new speed limits is unrealistic, so we want to uh, educate the public and uh, focus on strategies that provide that real-time feedback uh, that shifts driver behavior. So this would include implementing mobile radar signs uh, at locations such as speed transition zones entering the city, school zones, and uh, identified uh, problematic locations uh, where there's a history of excessive speeding. Uh, we've identified uh, four major uh, components uh, to implement this plan, um, all related to signage. Um, so that, it, again, that includes 25 mile per hour signage, speed radar signs, school zone flasher assemblies, as well as variable message boards uh, that would be deployed kind of in the initial uh, lowering of, of the speed limits and um, be positioned at uh, key gateway entrances to the city. Uh, as far as funding sources uh, go, the new 25 mile per hour signage, uh, you know, we assume uh, using the in-place signposts, uh, and that would be our identified funding source is the City Council Strategic uh, Priorities funding uh, with a general fund used for maintenance and replacement of that signage. Uh, the general fund uh, would be used to fund new speed radar signs and the City Council Strategic Priorities uh, would be used to fund the school zone flasher assembly and uh, variable message boards. And then lastly, and maybe the most important part piece of this is uh, that uh, we recommend that staff complete and present a initial evaluation of speed limit changes uh, to the city council within three years of implementation of speed limit changes. So this evaluation would look at uh, before and after changes, so before and after the change to the speed limit, and it would focus on speeds on local streets, uh, crash history, uh, pedestrian and bicycle activity, as well as additional traffic safety uh, metrics. And on to our uh, recommendation for the traffic calming request program. Uh, so just as a reminder of what traffic calming is, um, traffic calming is uh, changing the street design uh, to encourage uh, slower speeds and reduce cut through traffic. Um, the change in street design is supported by education and traffic awareness strategies, uh, leaning less on enforcement. Um, our specific goal with traffic calming with the neighborhood traffic management program is to help city staff uh, prioritize requests from the residents across the city uh, by identifying uh, a set of uh, selection criteria. Um, we've reviewed the existing traffic calming process and uh, we've noted some areas for 
improvement, and we're recommending a two-year cyclical process um, that, as shown on the screen, that would start with uh, re requests submitted by the public, uh, prior prioritization of the requests by city staff with the criteria I'll uh, go into on a further slide. In the spring of year one, uh, there would be information gathering, so that would include uh, speeds, traffic volumes, pedestrian and bicycle activity, uh, as well as uh, input from the community to better define uh, what, what the problem is. Uh, city staff would present um, a recommended uh, traffic calming treatment and receive feedback from the community. Uh, there is also the option to uh, install a trial traffic calming device so that uh, members in the community uh, can better understand of how a more permanent installation uh, w would function. So based on the input information gathering and community input, staff would recommend uh, a traffic calming treatment for Planning Commission and City Council uh, at the end of year one uh, for approval. Assuming approval uh, in year two, uh, it would go to construction and then evaluation. Uh, this traffic calming request uh, program uh, is eligible for local only local streets. Uh, traffic safety issues on non-local streets uh, would be addressed by staff using other programs and uh, city res designated city resources. As I mentioned, um, by establishing a set prioritization criteria, um, staff can prioritize requests uh, citywide, uh, really where uh, community and tr transportation needs are greatest. So we've identified five criteria um, listed uh, or weighted highest to lowest. Uh, so that includes traffic, uh, uh, pedestrian and bicycle experience, uh, equity, community destinations. So notably that includes schools, parks, and other important community destinations, uh, as well as uh, the number of people uh, nearby uh, the requested location. Um, speed data, uh, unfortunately, is not widely available for all local streets, uh, but that is an additional data point that would be considered um, if all the requests had somehow had a uh, <laughs> um, speed data, then it would be a bonus criteria. Um, we've identified uh, several uh, major considerations for traffic calming options. So this includes uh, effectiveness, so um, the propensity of a traffic calming treatment to reduce speeds, uh, reduce number of crashes, and reduce the severity of crashes. Uh, cost is a very important consideration. So that's not only the construction costs, but it's the long-term operations and maintenance year-round, summer, fall, spring, <laughs> winter, uh, as well as uh, we want to consider uh, um, maintenance, ADA accessibility, impacts to bicycle and pedestrian mobility, as well as any uh, environmental impacts. We've simplified uh, the existing range of toolbox or range range of traffic calming treatments to two tiers. The first tier includes uh, vertical elements, so that includes speed cushions, speed humps, and speed tables, as well as curb extensions and neighborhood traffic circles. Uh, we've included more information on each of these traffic calming treatments uh, in the report. Uh, I think it's just important to to know that each of these uh, tools has a you know a works for different issues uh, that the city is trying to solve and the issues that uh, residents have have brought up. Um, in this first tier of traffic calming options, uh, there's 
the option to, as I mentioned before, install uh, trial devices to, to test uh, these ideas and to get that community feedback and buy-in. The second tier of traffic calming options uh, generally require, um, are generally more complex and require more engineering. Uh, some of them have potential impacts to street network, so um, we're recommending that the second tier of options, which includes chicanes, partial closures, diverters, and chokers, uh, would be, these options would be included with the pavement management program. As with the lower speed limits, uh, we've uh, developed an implementation plan. Um, the first component uh, from a uh, policy standpoint uh, would be removing the existing petition uh, requirement and application fee, uh, which we've identified as a potential burden to, to residents. Secondly, uh, along a similar theme, uh, we're recommending changing the funding structure from exclusively a special tax assessment for property owners to incorporate other funding sources. As I mentioned before, um, the traffic calming uh, request process uh, will be uh, intertwined with the pavement management uh, program process. Um, so as shown on this slide, uh, the TAN boxes indicate where the traffic calming request program would uh, sync up with the existing steps in the pavement management program. So in year one, starting with a request in the winter, there would be the spring uh, look ahead uh, neighborhood meetings to discuss traffic issues in the summer. Uh, there would be the option to deploy traffic calming devices. And then in the fall, there would be that neighborhood meeting to discuss uh, residents' experience with the traffic calming devices and if any changes uh, would be needed uh, before advancing to a more permanent uh, traffic calming device. Uh, in terms of uh, budget considerations, we've identified three uh, major um, line items, so that includes the need for additional tube counters uh, to support uh, the additional data collection needs, uh, as well as um, construction costs for permanent and trial traffic calming treatments. As I mentioned before, uh, we're recommending a mix of funding sources uh, for the Tier 1 traffic calming treatments, so that includes uh, City Council's strategic priorities funding, general funding, and a reduced uh, but not eliminated uh, special tax assessment. Um, you'll note the asterisks. Uh, we're also recommending that uh, City Council's stri strategic priorities uh, be used to fund those Tier 1 traffic calming treatments in areas prioritized due to equity considerations, uh, therefore waiving uh, the need for a special tax assessment and thus lowering the burden on those communities. And then lastly, uh, we're recommending uh, evaluation. So that's at the project level. So performing a evaluation uh, within three years of implementation of each traffic calming treatment uh, to include vehicle speeds, volumes, crash history, uh, but also consideration of other metrics important to the community. The second evaluation uh, recommendation is for the entire program. Um, we don't think we're going to get it exactly right <laughs> the first time around, so I think it's important to uh, have a check-in within three years, uh, perform that evaluation to assess who in the community is using the program, how many people are using it, uh, what is the impact on funding and staff resources, and what is the general awareness in the community. Uh, we recommend, um, again, uh, supporting the traffic, these changes uh, to the traffic calming request program 
with neighborhood-based engagement, uh, providing a one-stop shop on the city website so people know what tools are available, can know what the considerations are of traffic calming treatments perhaps being considered for their street, and really just boost awareness and uh, understanding of what what the options are um, uh, for residents. Um, for we also recommend uh, development of a plain language guide and using uh, things such as yard signs and sidewalk details to make any proposed changes more visible to the community um, members. So not just people driving, but also people walking and biking on streets. Um, and with that, uh, we present two recommended uh, motion options, uh, the first of which is to accept the neighborhood traffic management program, and the second is to not accept the program at this time, but have staff modify the program as you see fit. Thank you for your time and patience. Thank you, Mr. Hayhurst. Appreciate it. Also, questions? Councilmember D'Alessandro. I have one question about the um, about the uh, stuff that's included in the PMP. I, I don't see uh, generally reduction of the actual width of the road, which is something we've talked about before as an option as well. <clears throat> and so I'm curious as to whether or not, um, as part of PMP analysis, would would we would we consider a full reduction? You know. A, a, What's the opposite of widening? A narrowing. There we go. Wow. 10 o'clock. <laughs> a narrowing of the road itself as opposed to some of the other treatments that you mentioned. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember D'Alessandro, you are correct. To date, we have not explored um, moving cur existing curbing gutters with the exception of some narrowing at the intersections. Um, but if we had a traffic calming request, we would treat that differently here in the future? Does that answer your question? I feel like I've missed part of it. N no, it was just, it was just um, when we put, when, when, when you had the slide up for the toolkit, mm -hmm. it wasn't part of the toolkit. And I was wondering if that was intentional or if there was a reason it wasn't included in the toolkit. Oh, just the narrowing? Yes, correct. Um, narrowing as, a, as one of these options. It wasn't included. I was just curious if there's a reason for that. We, the reason it hasn't been concluded to date is just the cost and the assessment of the curb and gutter, if it, the street has existing curb and gutter. Our current practice with um, streets that don't have curb and gutter is we send them out a survey and we say city standard roadway width is 32 feet, but now is a great opportunity for you to weigh in. And if you want 28 feet, the parking would be limited to one side of the street. And so we've done that at the upcoming meetings. And we have the 2024 projects. We have three different neighborhood streets that are targeted for that survey. But we have not done that um, with streets that have existing curb and gutter, whether it's 32 feet, which is our current standard, or our old standard, which is 36 feet, just because of the cost and expense. We haven't felt that people were willing to pay an additional assessment. So if you're willing to open that up, we could certainly add that to our tier two thing. It, to, to us, it's more of a financial consideration on how are we going to pay for, you know, 600 feet of curb and gutter if it's on one block and if it's, you know, half a mile long, that cost goes up fairly quickly. Understood. Is, is it your um, assessment that the, so the cost obviously is a significantly greater than these other options in your toolbox. Completely understood, especially if we were be essentially tearing something out we just put in a couple of years ago. Totally get that. Um, is there is there a on the benefit side? Is there is there ever enough benefit to decide to to, to justify that? Meaning, is the is the um, the narrowing knowing that narrowing is a good tool? How good is it? In like, would would we want to have that as a as an understood consideration so that we could give that information to a resident community and say, yeah, it's going to be expensive because we're going to be ripping out everything, but here's the benefit for you. And you know, if you really want to solve your problem that way, 
uh, if you really want to solve your problem, that's the way. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm curious if there's a if there's a reason to consider it ever. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember mm-hmm. D'Alessandro, I think that goes to personal preference on values and what you value. Um, so I don't think you're going to get a clear answer from the community. And I would suspect if we did a survey, we'd get 50% for and 50% against. And we'd be like, okay, scratching our heads, what what is the right thing to decide? Because it does have, narrower roads do have the ability to slow down traffic. And that has a benefit, as we've seen from some of the pedestrian graphics you saw earlier. In the winter, if we have a winter like we had in 2022, 2023, it limits your ability for emergency response. It limits your ability for parking. So it all comes down to what do you value and how much do you value it? Appreciate Thank you. Other questions, Council? All right. Well, thank you. We did have in the agenda that we were going to provide a public comment opportunity to item 4.9. And I would like to open that public comment opportunity right now. If anyone here in the chambers or on the phone would like to make a public comment regarding item 4.9, the neighborhood traffic management plan, you're welcome to come forward now. No one in the chambers coming forward? Mr. Billard, anybody on the phone? Uh, Mr. Mayor, nobody on the phone for this item. All right, then we will close our public comment period on item 4.9 tonight. And I will turn to the council for any additional discussion and or possible action on this. And uh, I I will say, council, I mean, I'll just kick it off saying, when we first started talking about this, we we said flat out, no, we couldn't just, you can't just reduce the speed limit out of this problem. We've got to, we, we needed to look at different ways to address this and talked about, um, the, the education, the enforcement, the, uh, the environmental changes that are possible that we would make and, and all the different pieces. And I, I do appreciate that this proposed plan uh, touches on many of those. And, it, and it's, uh, it gives plenty of options and uh, plenty of tools in the toolkit as we look to reduce the speed in, in neighborhoods. Um, I will say one point uh, uh, that surprised me, the just looking at the, the speeds on Vesey Road, I never would have guessed that they were actually sub 30 miles an hour on average. And that surprises me, but also that encourages me. And that encourages me that uh, we can get there with our other neighborhoods as well. And whether it's just anecdotal that there's one or two speeders in the neighborhood, or it's a consistent problem, at least we have, um, we have data that shows that it's possible it can be solved in a, and, and it can become the norm which is basically what we're looking for. I don't think we, we don't want to pull people over and, and ticket everybody into this. We want this just to become the norm. Everybody thinks when you're in the neighborhoods, you're driving within the speed limit. You're driving reasonably. You're not putting kids in danger. You're improving the quality of life for everybody who lives in that neighborhood. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I'm also encouraged just as I sat here uh, because I, I think in the presentation it said that you know, I mentioned we always hear that Minneapolis and St. Paul have reduced their speed limit, but they also mentioned several other communities. I just did a quick Google search and came up with, in addition to uh, St. Louis Park, uh, in Edina, Golden Valley, St. Anthony, Rochester, Maple Grove, New Brighton, Arden Hills, Bayport, Melrose, and Montemedi. And that was just as I was sitting here scrolling quickly during the presentation. I apologize. I was listening, but I was also I was multitasking is what I was doing. And so, hmm? to 25. To 25, not down to 20, but to 25. And uh, so as we get the much expected uh, blowback from some folks that we're just trying to be like Minneapolis and lowering our speed limit, no, we're, we're, we're actually a little bit behind the curve in terms of uh, a lot of the uh, communities in, in Minnesota who are looking to make their community safer by reducing the speed limit to 25 miles an hour. So uh, again, I'm, uh, I think this is... This is a good process. I, I think they've, there's been a lot of thought put into it. There's been a lot of feedback taken on this, and, and I think um, I'm, I'm ready to move it forward and, and consider it and, and make it part of, of what we have and, and see where it goes from here in response to, once again, the most common thing that I hear from residents in this city. Yep. Council Member Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, So I also will be supporting the proposal moving forward. Um, I also agree that most people in Bloomington do not know what the speed is on local streets. I did my own study 
was very scientific of just asking people <laughs> randomly. But I mean, I just asked people, like, do you know what the speed limit is? And nobody, nobody knew. And so uh, the one thing I would say um, is for us to consider actually adding more speed limit signs throughout the city. Uh, I think I was I was looking at the C one of the Seattle studies, and they did say new speed limit signs installed in greater density also um, contribute to the program success. And so uh, that was one thing I kind of wanted to flag. Um, but I do think in our last conversation, somebody had mentioned that there wasn't research that showed that decreasing speeds um, actually slows people down. And, and and as was mentioned today, that th there are studies that show that decreasing speed limits slow people down. Um, and reduce the number of crashes, and then also those crashes are less dangerous, as the data shows us. So um, the last thing I would just say, I think the legislature approved um, a study on speed safety cameras at this last legislative session. Um, and so I would just encourage us to kind of watch how that goes, because in the future, if cities can adopt speed safety cameras, I think that would be an excellent thing for us to work on, maybe in partnership with Hennigan County, um, to enforce. I think enforcement comes with all la all kinds of layers of issues, um, but if it is a speed safety camera, I mean, it's pretty straightforward if you get caught speeding on camera, or if your vehicle does. My husband got me a speeding ticket once, but um, so yeah, otherwise, you know, I think this is great. I really appreciate the, the research and the intentionality and all of the community engagement and all of the conversation that we've had. Oh, one last thing I was gonna to say too. Um, the school speed zones, very supportive of re reducing those speed limits. Um, I will say some schools are in neighborhoods and even 20 seems like it might be a lot. And I know we wanna have consistency, but I think about like my kids go to Hillcrest and the way it's set up over there, I think 15 would be plenty. Um, so I would just say, like, let's keep an, an open mind maybe about whether it's 15 or 20 in those school zones. Um, but with that, I will, I will leave it at that. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Mua. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Very, uh, very quickly, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this. Thank you for all your work. Uh, staff did a great job. I think um, I feel I feel heard. I hope that residents do too, um, and both as a resident and as a council member. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I didn't see in tonight's proposal, you mentioned it at the beginning, but not during the presentation, was um, traffic calming efforts around our parks. I, I'm assuming that's deferred. That's kind of being managed as part of the park's master plan as opposed to a traffic calming program, but I'm okay either way. I just wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of that. That's still really important. I don't wanna spend millions of dollars on our parks and then have not solved making sure kids can get to them safely. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Thanks. Council Member Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I fully support the, the school zone reductions um, and the traffic calming options. I still have hesitations with the local streets but what I like and what we saw tonight was that there is a study in those other streets that I have more concerns about. And so my preference would be to see the local street option and the collector street options together uh, to see what the collective uh, reduction would be for that um, versus passing that together with everything as the, the motion is laid out. And so that, that's where my hesitation is still at. I still don't think unless we do something with these other streets that are really the, the main issues that contribute to the local issue, um, I, I, I just don't think that's comprehensive enough for me to, to support this right now. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this in particular because I'm kind of imagining down the line when we've had, say, our first neighborhood step forward. They, uh, it turns out that we have data to verify that there is the safety issue. They pick a couple options out of the traffic calming toolbox, and then we can put that on the front page of the briefing and say, let us walk you through the beginning of this process to the end and show you what it looks like for community members stepping up and leading change in their neighborhood. I think that that gets to the heart of a lot of the public engagement that we're doing in a lot of different areas of the city. Um, and could serve as a pretty neat concrete example that'll get people curious. And, and I think uh, kind of uh, even further down the line, as we're seeing this program of neighbors raising their hand to flag issues as kind of the canary in, in the coal mine, how can we start aggregating some of that data to say we're seeing consistent patterns about the type of streets where folks are having these concerns and we're just gonna start working traffic calming toolbox options into the regular course of our PMP moving forward in similarly situated streets. 
um, mm -hmm. which I'm sure staff is already way out ahead on and doing some of already, but just to make sure that, that the folks that, that have the time to advocate for themselves and participate in a process like this is informing our thinking about the rest of the community as opposed to dictating our project ordering. Councilmember Member Lohman, any thoughts on this? Well, all I'll say is I was surprised that uh, this didn't pass the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, that shocked me, um, especially with this body, you know, really wanting to look at it. So that that kind of kind of concerned me. I appreciate your your comments. I, I certainly am concerned um, about those other areas. Um, but hey, I mean, talk about a perfect policy. I've got nothing to say in complaining about this. <laughs> nothing. So I uh, I will say, Councilmember Moore, to your concerns. Um, I don't think anything that I've seen presented tonight precludes further work on how to slow traffic down on, on some of those other streets as well. Uh, some we, we don't have control over, the, the county roads, we, we're at the mercy of the county roads in a lot of ways, but I don't think anything that we've heard tonight or anything that we've talked about precludes additional, uh, additional study, additional work, additional uh, efforts to slow people down. Because you're right, that's where, um, I mean, frankly, the, the neighborhoods are bad. Old Shakopee Road at rush hour is terrifying sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I agree with you there. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I think we can continue that conversation. Mr. Mayor, a yes. uh, quick, quick specific comment on that. I think, uh, Councilmember Mua, that's a, a great point. Um, I, in the hierarchy um, slides that uh, – Kirk presented, I think that was the goal, right, was to, to try to create the, tr the the striation so that it's more clear to people when they are on a collector street and they're not on the collector street. Um, is there any reason we can't also provide direction to, to move on that today? I, um, no. So so it may be a one-two thing as opposed to delay and one thing, but we could still probably get it. I don't know what the timing was for that, but I, I don't think I want to let that fall behind either. I think it was a really important step for us to be looking at. So I don't know, um, I don't know, Kirk, if that's something you were expecting, we would be giving you direction on tonight and it would be a short term thing versus a lot term. I don't know, Mr. Mayor, what you're thinking on that. Mayor Bussey, Council Member D'Alessandro. So I need to get a gauge on, on the intent of the council with regards to the local streets, because that forms the basis of where we go from here on our larger streets. And so with the, with the, the, it sounds like the direction the council is going to go on this, we will bring the uh, larger streets issue, the speed limits on those forward to you next in the next uh, few weeks or so, or month or so, um, for your approval on that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Sounds reasonable. Yeah, that's great. Council Member Mua. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think my, just my preference is I would rather see this um, together with the larger streets. Uh, so that's my major hesitation with it. Understood. Council, any additional discussion on this? Or are we ready to see some motion, some action on this? I'd be happy to make the motion. Council Member D'Alessandro. I will make the motion to accept the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept the Neighborhood Traffic Management Plan as presented. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-1 with Council Member Mui in opposition. Thank you. Good work on this. And um, I am looking forward to seeing how we continue to move on this. This is, this is good stuff, and it, uh, it's overdue. And as I keep saying, it's one, something that we keep hearing from folks that we need to happen. So well done and looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, may I ask a question? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you. Um, will will we have the city staff then, as we've kind of defined here, that part of this is that we're going to fund this out of strategic priorities? That was one of the things that we asked. Are we going to – I think there's a budget presentation for strategic priorities coming up. Can we make sure that this is included in that so we have an understanding of the impact? I, I think – it would have to be part of the deal here. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. I just wanted to make a note of it. Thank you. Yep. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, with us approving this tonight, when would the 25 mile an hour on local streets go into effect? 
Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Carter, we don't have a date certain for that because we want to do one educational program for our community. We think it would be confusing if we did 25 miles and then three months later we said, hey, and by the way, on the collectors, you're going to be driving 30 and 35, so we want complete. to hold them all together. So as part of the implementation program, you saw we had different policies and um, ordinance changes that need to be coming. So you'll get a packet of all of them together to Councilmember Mua's point. Like, we don't want to dri dribble it out. We want to have one comprehensive, this is our education program, and this is what we're changing, and it's going to be effective, let's arbitrarily say May 1st. But I don't actually know that, so don't hold me okay. back to that date. Perfect. Thank you. That makes sense. Councilmember Moment. Mayor, did we include the extra additional signs that Councilmember Carter talked about? Because I like that idea. I wasn't sure if we included that at all or not. Uh, mm. What? The additional signs that Councilman Ricard asked for? Uh, I, I don't think we did. I think we it was included in the in the plan. I mean, re-signage. I don't think extra signs was necessarily included. It certainly couldn't be something that, as we talk about this, is a strategic priority funding. Okay, um, yeah, maybe we get get yeah. that. So hopefully you'll remember that because I like that idea. I just slipped my mind when we came around to talking about it. Yep. Okay. Again, thank you. Thanks for the conversation. Our final item tonight, as always, is our city council policy and issue update. And I will kick us off, council. I've got actually three things, and I'll go quickly as I can. First of all, in our council listening session tonight, we heard from two people. One, once again, a brand new person that we had not heard from tonight, uh, Miss uh, Diana De Cristina, talking about the Bryant Park renovation. She talked passionately and eloquently and intellectually and very uh, uh, creatively about what might need to happen to make Bryant Park the Bryant Park rec renovation a success. So we thank her and the other neighbors for being there that this evening and for bringing that forward to us. And uh, Ms. Sally Ness asked for an internal affairs investigation uh, regarding uh, her interactions with some Bloomington detectives, and we will move that forward uh, through the proper channels uh, as it should be with the, within the police department. Uh, the second item that I want to bring forward is to tell you all uh, about the city manager, Mr. Verbrugge, and I, our trip to Japan as part of the U.S. Midwest U.S. Japan Association Summit in Tokyo. Uh, just as a quick recap, the, that association, that group, has been meeting for 53 years now. It's a group of 10 United States in the Midwest that meets and in, in regularly, annually, with uh, Japanese business community, and um, to discuss economic issues, trade issues. Uh, investment issues and, and so on. Highly successful meeting, I thought. And I'd, I'd be curious to hear Mr. Verbrugge, Mr. Verbrugge can jump in at any time as well. But uh, highly successful to, to hear from all of the governors who were uh, on board. We were there with Governor Walls, uh, and as well as uh, Governor Whitmer from Michigan, uh, the governor of um, of Indiana was along, governor of Nebraska. We, we had a number of governors from the United States as well as a number of governors from prefectures in Japan, talking about the economic issues, the economic conditions, the trade that has gone on, the relationships that have been built. And I think that's been the key to all of this, is the, the relationships that have been built between the two uh, groups over the course of the past 50 so or so years. Minnesota first took part in this in 2019, and we heard from Governor Walls that since that time, trade with Japan in Minnesota has increased by 50%. So clearly there is the, the success story behind that and we're looking to get a piece of that for Bloomington because we have, we have international business here in Bloomington but we want to look, we're looking for ways obviously to expand that in, in as many ways as possible. We also had the opportunity to uh, uh, have lunch with the governor and uh, the commissioner of deed and a few other folks uh, with the, um, the executives from Nankin Corporation in in Japan and Nankin owns polar semiconductors and so we had a very good discussion with them and it was uh, good and enlightening and helpful to to meet with the, uh, the the Japanese counterparts of the we know the folks here at polar very well we talk to them all the time to talk to their folks in, in Japan and to express our thanks for their continued investment in um, uh, excuse me Sankin did I say Nankin I meant Sankin thank you very much uh, their continued investment in Minnesota and uh, the work that they are doing and their um, their commitment to Minnesota and the, and the uh, expansion of the, the polar facility. Uh, we had the opportunity to present to the Osaka Chamber of Commerce. We talked about uh, uh, that relationship building importance, um, 
in, in a lot of different ways. We visited the Osaka World Expo site. They have a lot of work to do in the next 18 months before the World Expo is scheduled to open. And the final uh, very enjoyable time was we spent time in Izumi City with the group, the folks who were just here about a month ago. Uh, we went to see them and it was quite the party. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan joined us there and we knew we were into something different as we rolled up and there was about 40 people on the sidewalk cheering and waving banners and, and waiting for us and the TV cameras and, and all that was going on. And we had a chance, I uh, made an address to their city council. Uh, we had a formal tea, we had a formal ceremony. It, it, was, it was really something and it was, it was really worthwhile and, and good to do. And more than anything, as I kept stressing, we, we talked about business with a lot of folks, a lot of economic talk, but more than anything, it was about the relationship building. And we saw that with every stop that we made, and for that matter, uh, within our travel party as well. It was with the governor and the lieutenant governor. It was with the new commissioner of DEED, Matt Verilich. Uh, it was with the staff from DEED, who we work with constantly, but to be able to interact and talk with them. Folks from Greater MSP, from uh, Medical Alley. Uh, there was a Minnesota Ag group that was out there at the same time. So this whole notion of cultivating relationships was, was fully on, on display. Uh, both uh, with the folks that we, we know well, we got to know better, and to make new uh, contacts uh, over in Japan. And so it was definitely a, a worthwhile trip and, and definitely beneficial and looking forward to, to seeing what might come of it in the future. So anything to add, Mr. Verbrugge? It's an excellent summary, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would just extend my, my gratitude, especially to the folks in Azumi City, Mayor Suji, and uh, Mr. Koshimo, who is the uh, director of their sister city exchange organization, the hospitality that they extended uh, was tremendous. And the fact that the state of Minnesota uh, coordinated almost every element of that uh, visit yes. and had Lieutenant Governor Flanagan along for it uh, was, uh, was um, truly gratifying. And I just want to say thank you to the uh, staff at the trade office at the Department of Employment and Economic Development. They do a fantastic job coordinating a, uh, a governor delegation and a, uh, uh, an agriculture department uh, delegation and then inviting along uh, community uh, members. Uh, we were not the only city represented there, city of Brooklyn Park, city of Stillwater. Uh, also have interests in uh, Japanese companies uh, and uh, trying to develop uh, trade and, and business development and uh, with Japanese interests. Uh, one of the things that came out of our discussion in Izumi was a very strong interest on their part to doing some sort of business uh, exchange and in trying to develop some sort of business relationship between our two communities more so than exists today. And so over the next year, I committed to uh, Mayor Suji and their uh, council uh, chairperson, uh, Sakamoto, that we would uh, work on that as we continue to try to foster that relationship. Thank you for that addendum, Mr. Verbrugge. Very, very well done. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the council on, on, our, on our trip? Council Member Lohman? Uh, not really a comment, just uh, just I uh, want to commend both uh, the mayor and the manager uh, for having that opportunity to, to take that, uh, that that international trip and also having the opportunity uh, uh, to strengthen that relationship we have with their sister city uh, organization. I do, I do know that the, the mayor um, and the sister city um, president have uh, very much been interested in that, that business connection, and I look forward to seeing uh, how that uh, relationship blossoms. Um, so, again, thank you, guys. Uh, I know that was a little extra step that needed to be taken, but I uh, really do appreciate, um, you know, especially with all the history that we've had um, between our two uh, cities um, and what they're trying to do uh, in Japan. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the final piece that I have to add, this Thursday evening... Our friends at Oasis for Youth are hosting an event up at the Dinah Country Club, actually. It's called the Pathway Home. And it's, a, it, it's a, a bit of a fundraiser, but also a bit of a, an opportunity for them to share an update about their new programming, to talk to folks, and to uh, an opportunity to meet their new executive director. And so it's Thursday night, uh, Edina Country Club, 5 to 7.30. 
please let me know if you're interested in going. I'm going to certainly be there. I think uh, Mayor Hublin from Edina and Mayor uh, Seppel from Richfield are going to be there as well. But uh, I think it would be great to have any, any council members who might have an opportunity to be there. It would be great to have you there as well, and I know they would appreciate it. Uh, if, if you're interested in going, we're, we're past the RSVP deadline, but if you just let me know, I'll pass it on to them and off we go. So thanks so very much. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I have two quick things. Um, uh, in a similar vein, uh, um, so I had the honor and privilege uh, to be invited to speak at the State of Black Health Conference along with Community Development Director Carla Henderson and um, Chief Equity Officer Faith Jackson. Um, so the focus of the conference was obviously on health, but really specifically institutional injustices, economic barriers, and then wellness and chronic disease disparities. So a lot of sessions around uh, social determinants of health. So transportation, housing, access to health care, um, tobacco. And so really, really good sessions. And it, I will say it just made me very proud of like the work that we've done in Bloomington and, and in Minnesota in general, talking with people across the country. Um, we really are leading the way in many ways. And so our session um, was really focused on talking about the racial equity work that we've done in Bloomington, from the racial equity business plan to declaring racism a public health crisis, and then the establishment of the Office of Racial Equity and Inclusion and Belonging. Um, and it was very, very well attended. Um, we had very good feedback and people reaching out afterwards wanting to talk more. So uh, really, really happy and proud of the work there. Um, and the second thing, um, so I've just become aware of um, a couple of people who have resigned from our boards and commissions, and it reminded me when we did our boards and when we revamped the application process, um, I know I brought this up, I think others probably did too at the time, that we really should be not only, um, you know, making sure the application process is um, a good one and an equitable one, but also making sure we're evaluating the experience that people have on our boards and commissions um, so that we, so when there are issues, we have the opportunity to improve. And, and I don't, I don't know why certain people resigned. I don't know the details, um, but it is concerning when you start to see some trends. And so uh, I really think that we need to have that evaluation built into part of um, our boards and commissions process and and then also really you know make sure that we're looking at the data related to the evaluation too so um, and see if there's trends there thank you council member congratulations on the successful presentation council member Loman. Uh, thank you, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll rearrange my, my comments because I was going to talk about boards and commissions as well <laughs> um, and I you know just uh, I know I know we've had a number of folks who leave the the commissions and that type of thing, and I just think that one of the uh, parameters that uh, past councils had talked about, um, uh, Coulter, and I believe a, a few folks are up here. I think Carter and a number of folks have said, you know, we wanted to have whenever we're selecting people, try to have as many council members available. And I've just noticed uh, in a number of our our experiences, we haven't been able to get as many council members there. And so I wonder if we could, along with that evaluation um, that Councilmember Carter just brought forward, that we really look to try to find ways in which do we maybe designate times in the year and make that a part of our, our calendar or something for if we do have turnover um, that really allows us to kind of plan that, you know, maybe have it a Monday set aside so that we can all really be there. Because I've noticed that We've been most successful with keeping people uh, in our commissions when as many voices on this council have been able to participate uh, in that evaluation process. And so I would encourage us as we, we do that to not, you know, again, not, not take it away. I'm sure we'll have a great um, folks on, on sustainability, but want to make sure we have as many of those voices that are up here at that table as we do that. Um, so um, I don't know if, if other folks agree with me on that, but I hope that we'll consider that. Um, <coughs> Pardon me, uh, fighting a little bit of my uh, hard throat here. Um, I wanted to mention uh, that um, we've got gotten quite a few calls, um, uh, or at least I have, with regards to one of the elements uh, that are part of our sales tax piece around the uh, um, around the uh, nine mile um, <coughs> uh, uh, park uh, type. Piece, and I wanted to just get a clarification on that because I wanted to just be sure that my understanding was that we weren't going to have a 
uh, there is no proposal from the staff um, for a bike trail down in, in that area. That, that, that is still an open conversation. I'm not sure if city manager could, could comment on that because I've got you know folks that I know who I've talked to at the doors and that kind of thing. And they're, they're, they're convinced that we're putting in a, um, throughout the entire part of that, it's, it, this is not a, a natural resources plan. It is really a, a kind of a way to put in a, a bicycle trail. Mr. Verbrugge? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Loman, I appreciate you uh, uh, raising the issue. We've had uh, similar feedback as well. Uh, I think the the fact is that with that project, there's going to be a significant amount of engagement about the details of the project uh, if and when it is approved by voters. <coughs> uh, it is uh, primarily a, a natural resource. Uh, and ecological restoration project in addition to the uh, facilities in the parks that are adjacent to those areas. Uh, we do want to definitely improve accessibility so people of all mobilities uh, have the opportunity to enjoy those areas. And it is not being developed exclusively or primarily as a, uh, as a bike path. So I appreciate you raising that. Our staff is working to try and uh, provide some clarifying language for people who are looking for more information and uh, we'll continue to get that out as we move forward. Thank you, I'll leave it at, at that. Uh, uh, then the, uh, we had a conversation earlier today um, about pawn shops and what I might suggest that we do um, around that is have a conversations about um, those licenses within the city. Um, as a separate conversation. Um, I know we talked about how not wanting to have it in the Lindell area, but I'm wondering if we need to re-evaluate whether or not um, pawn shops make a sense and or what the, re what the requirements are um, uh, in our city, if there's a way that we can either move them around or eliminate them from the city. Um, uh, because I know that was the discussion with the Lindell piece, and I didn't want, I know that wasn't germane to the conversation we we're having then, but I wanted to raise it now um, and I'd be interested in having some conversations around those pot shop licenses. And then uh, finally, um, I just want to say uh, uh, to my colleagues that I, I've had a chance to work with, some of you won't be returning, <laughs> or, and we know one person won't be returning. Um, I just want to say how much I've enjoyed working with uh, each and every one of you. I know Sean's not here, um, but uh, you know, as we get towards the end of the year here, just want to thank you. Um, you're, each and every single person here has a fine point of view and perspective who has brought a lot to uh, this community. Um, I, I look forward to uh, serving with you and the, and the next council, if that's what ends up happening. Um, but just want to say how much I've enjoyed uh, being here with you and uh, arguing over uh, certain things and disagreeing with you and agreeing with certain things. Uh, it has made uh, my days uh, very uh, exciting, and I uh, just enjoy uh that this dialogue and just I want to thank you uh, for the dedication that you put into uh, giving back uh, to the city of Bloomington and its residences. Um, it's uh, uh, the, the the pay certainly doesn't match uh, the, the type of dedication that each of you uh, put into this. And I wanted to just thank you, um, no matter what, <laughs> for what you've done. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember D'Alessandro. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wasn't sure whether or not uh, Councilmember Lohman was going to mention this or not, so I uh, will take them and do this. Um, uh, Councilmember Lohman and I had the chance to uh, join <clears throat> Padao Yang, who is presenting at the AIP2 conference in Seattle this uh, past Friday, and we talked about the Welcome to Bloomington design team process that we went through to try to uh, to provide other members of that um, that organization's um, uh, the folks that were attending the convention uh, the opportunity to understand what we did, how we did it, um, what we took away from it, um, what the engagement looked like, and um, so it was really great to offer that uh, opportunity to to that. We were obviously virtual. Um, but it was uh, it was a nice way for us to share, you know, yet another um, intentional activity with community engagement that um, was driving the you know Bloomington Tomorrow Together plan. So um, I think that was really cool, and I thank Councilmember Lohman for showing up for it because otherwise it would have just been me. That would have been weird. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Padau did a great job. So you know, kudos to Padau for. Um, 
you know, I think I don't, she was setting things up for me while on uh, leave and stuff like that from, um, uh, so, you know, she obviously worked uh, very, very hard to, to be a part of that uh, presentation. So it was good. And I hope that at some point we'll have some recap of it. Yeah. Oh, and also, uh, I had the privilege of doing the council minute this oh. past week. Uh, thank you. Well done. Mayor. You did a good job. Yeah. I think, well, if council member Loman would have listened to it, you'd have known the questions about the mine mile Creek, but that's all right. <laughs> no judgment, no judgment. <laughs> um, uh, it was really fun. I never had I'd never had a chance to work with a teleprompter before. It was my very first time. Uh, so, um, and it's very big font, and I didn't change it for you. I promise. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, it was really cool, and we. I just can't say enough about Emily Taplin and just how incredibly professional and competent she is. It was a real pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks for pinch hitting on that. You did a jo- did a nice job. So. Council, is there anything else tonight? If not, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. No further business. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? (coughs) Motion carries 6-0. We are adjourned. Thanks for the discussion tonight, Council. Staff, well done. Thank you very much. Everybody who tuned in tonight and stuck with us, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your week.